three. Please stand for the Pledge of Allegiance. Pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, with indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Everybody okay with the light level? Okay. <laughs> Madam Secretary, when you're ready, roll call, please. Andrew Banowitz. Here. Tim Neville. Here. Mary Ann Turner. Here. Kelly Davis. Here. Charlie Masterberti. Here. Rich Stroney. Here. Rob Kwasnicki. Here. Fire evacuation notice. There's two ways to exit the chamber tonight. One is to the rear of the audience, down and onto the town green. The other is to the right of the audience, down the stairs, and out into the parking lot. Uh, town attorney's report. Everybody's taken notice of what was in your packets and circulated today? Yes. Yep. Okay. Uh, moving on to old business. Madam Secretary. ZBA 2023-0303, 500-524 Enfield Street, appeal of the cease and desist order for section 5.20. Business District's use table, Kenneth Bedard, Fred Joseph, LLC applicant, James Blaze, owner, MAP 33, lot 65, MAP 33, lot 66, BL zone. And the applicant can come forward. Good evening, Mr. Chairman, members of the board. For the record, Attorney Carl Landolina, Fahey and Landolina, 487 Spring Street, Windsor Locks, Connecticut. I'm joined to my right by Ken Bedard, who is the, uh, a member of the LLC that owns and operates the uh, Pizza Palace restaurant and um, the facilities located within. Um, I have some handouts. Before I start, seven of you, huh? Okay. One, two, three, four, six, seven. I believe Mr. Rochelle already has a copy of these documents. These are the ones I got. Yeah. And I do have a second set as well, other parts of the regulations. So what I'd like to talk to you tonight about, ladies and gentlemen, is the history of zoning in the town of Enfield as with respect to uh, liquor permits. Um, actually, I was doing some other research today for another matter, which is on the docket later on. And um, I had a chance to go through some uh, minutes of zoning commission meetings back into the 40s. And um, so I guess I'll start there and work my way forward, so to speak. This is um, somewhat relevant. Uh, there was a package store on, still there maybe, Slaybards, that's what I, we used to always call it. It's probably called something else now. And in 1941, someone representing the Slaybard family, Mr. Slaybard, I assume, went before the Zoning Commission. And in the minutes of a meeting back in 1941, they start off saying that uh, he was producing a copy of the State Liquor Control Act that existed in the early 40s. And they, and this must have been a second meeting he was attending to talk about selling liquor at a for retail on, on a site on Enfield Street. The Zoning Commission looked at the regulations 
and looked at uh, the Liquor Control Act and determined that they had no jurisdiction over the licensing of the sales of alcoholic beverages here in town in 1941. So let's bring you forward to 1966, which is on the top you'll see it says 11366. This was the first time that the uh, town of Enfield, as far as I could see, looking back at the zoning regulations back to actually 1925, that the town regulated sales of alcoholic beverages uh, in, in the zoning context. And you can look through it. Basically, there are separating distances, talks about different types of licenses, classes of licenses, and that's generally how the, um, the uh, Liquor Control uh, Act was, different types of classes for licenses. And uh, then it talks about, um, you know, square footage of buildings. What it doesn't differentiate is, for instance, a restaurant license. It doesn't state anything to do with what happens inside a bar or a restaurant that has a liquor license and a, with a bar um, that may be accessory to the use of the bar. So as you probably all know, uh, many times you'll go into a, an establishment, a bar, and there'll be some kind of entertainment going on. So going back into 1966, the first time that I could see that you regulated uh, liquor licenses, there's no differentiation between alcohol license and alcohol licenses with entertainment, and that becomes crucial in a few minutes. I also included the 1975 version, which essentially is the same as the 1966 version. Again, separating distances, square foot requirements, all right, a prohibition uh, in industrial zones. The next version, actually I don't have it here because it was just the same. And you can actually, we'll ignore this next page for a second. But the next version was the 1986 set, and it looked exactly like the 66 and 75 versions. Okay, so they're not attached? It's not there, but um, it's, more, it's more of the same. It's exactly the same. Uh, it, it, they regulated by uh, class licenses, class of licenses uh, and separating distance, and it was a prohibition uh, for industrial use. There was no mention of entertainment in the 86 version. The 86 version of your regulations went on for about uh, 14 or 15 years. There might have been some minor amendments along the way but none that I could find with respect to liquor licenses. The first, uh, the next wholesale change in your regulations was in 2001. And in 2001, that's when we first saw uh, use tables. They didn't exist in your regulations before then, and you had more of a modern version of the regulations. I didn't attach those either, but they're exactly like, in the respect we're gonna talk about, exactly like the set that's currently uh, in effect. And section 5.2, which is the regulation that is cited in the cease and desist order, does require or does create for the first time two types of liquor permits. So if you go to the next handout, the third page, which is 62 of 144, the current regulations, which is exactly the same as existed in the 2001 version, at the bottom of page 62, or six, yes, you will see it in the use table, liquor permits in the BL, and we are in the BL zone, and the BG, a special use permit is required. 
And the next line down, you see liquor permits with any, any entertainment. Special permit, again, for the BL and BG zone. So in 2001, it was the first time that entertainment, having this accessory entertainment use, joined with a liquor license was ever mentioned in your zoning regulations. So the first two pages, I've taken the definitions and I've looked for a definition for the word entertainment. Doesn't exist. And I actually looked for, and that's page 15. And then I went on to page 17 where if the words live entertainment were defined, or that phrase, it would be in this page. Is there alphabetical? It's not there. So my contention is that the regulation of having entertainment of any kind with a liquor license started in 2001. Now, my client purchased the property in 2016, and when he purchased the property, as you know, liquor licenses are personal in nature. They don't travel with the business like a special permit or some other types of permits. So when my client bought the restaurant and the uh, operation there, he had to get a new liquor permit. And he, uh, I don't know what the process was before um, he went and did that, but a liquor permit requires a sign off by the zoning enforcement officer in the town of Enfield or any town. There's a spot specifically says that this use is not prohibited or conforms with the zoning regulations. I don't have a copy of that, but I can tell you the fact that he has a liquor permit and has renewed it annually means that someone, you can, I think you can infer reasonably that the zoning enforcement officer did in fact sign off. So that application at the time, he asked the prior owner, well, what do I do here? And they said, well, just check off one of the entertainment boxes and you're, you're good to go. So the other owner had checked off um, karaoke, so he checked off the box karaoke, it got signed, and um, I don't think, Rick, you were around in 16, were you? That was the prior zoning enforcement officer. And, um, and the prior owner had the same type of license with entertainment. Uh, and prior to that, it was a pizza place, and then the bar opened in 84 when Jimmy Bayless operated the facility. And we, we understand that he had some forms of entertainment as well. So. Your regulations say any entertainment. Well, karaoke seems to me to be entertainment. I, I, you know, that's part of your job is to use your common sense and what you know about. But so live enter or entertainment has been a part of this license here for, for many, many years. And if the state needs him to go back and check off more boxes to have bands or DJs or whatever it else that he, he thinks he wants to have there. That's a matter between him and the state of Connecticut, Department of Liquor Control. In our view, the town has already granted him in some fashion entertainment. We've got something signed from the zoning enforcement officer, which we relied on because I assume, having done closings like this, that you wouldn't have, you couldn't close until you got your liquor license, right? Correct. That was a condition of the contract. Nobody would, you know, no lawyer would let their client just buy a bar or a package store or any other facility without getting the permits first, because if you didn't get it for some reason, the deal would fall apart. So, um, you know, and, and he relied on that information. And last year, um, well, starting in 21, my client re, uh, applied for a uh, interior renovation of the space, and uh, he applied for a building permit. And included in that was the construction of a stage inside the facility. 
And the page that we didn't talk about was, and this is nowadays you don't get, you know, you have this fancy uh, system, right, to get building permits. You don't, in the old days you'd walk around or float around between departments, you'd actually get live signatures, but the zoning enforcement officer, you can see uh, on the left-hand side, timeline, application review, permit fee, zoning plan review, completed October 18th, 2021. That's checked. So uh, unless I hear otherwise, it seems to me that that's the zoning office saying, yeah, we approve of this, including the construction of a stage. And since live entertainment or entertainment had been uh, approved by the office, at least when my client uh, uh, acquired it, and certainly when the prior owner acquired it, um, you know, he sort of relied on that information and he spent, you know, thousands and tens of thousands, I assume, renovating it, building a stage so that he could uh, have other forms of entertainment, which were, we believe, approved, whether it was karaoke or anything else. There's, entertainment is entertainment. So the one thing I don't have is I'd be nice to have the Apple actual applications that went to liquor control back when Jimmy Bayless, you know, getting those things can be, can be difficult. If you think that they're crucial to your making a decision, we can ask for an extension. I would waive the time periods to do that and come back with those. If you think, uh, I, I think at this point, the argument is what, you, what you've heard. So, um, but as I say, 2000, 2001, when those regulations came out, it appears to us that there had been a liquor permit and that entertainment was going on. In, in that facility. And uh, I understand from, from talking with uh, Mr. Rochelle, and um, I think it's in his report, that he reviewed the minutes from the zoning regulations with respect to this property going back into the 80s, 87, 88. There's nothing there. It doesn't exist. There's no, no one ever came in and got any kind of permits between that date, whether, so that would lead me again, and it's reasonable to infer that, that uh, since the pizza palace was serving alcohol back to its inception, which you probably know better than I when it was, that no one thought that this needed anything else, any other kind of permit. Um, so, I, I thought that was kind of interesting as well. So when I, you know, typically I would go in and I'd walk upstairs and I'd look by address. You can search files and I've searched, you know, can I see the address on 12 Moody Road? And it'll have every application, every permit, every, you know, and they're very thick. In this case, when I went up and uh, there's, there is no file. It's basically like that, and it does. It only goes back to uh, really the most of what's in there is what we're talking about tonight. The you know the uh, the um, enforcement action against my client. There's nothing there about any special permits being obtained or or anything, which is unusual uh, in this town because you, you keep pretty good records. I also called um, you know your records manager, Greg. And, um, you know, he didn't, he didn't tell me that there was anything else out there other than what would be in the, the planning department's office. And, and that, and Rick can attest to this. It was, it was very little, Rick, as from what I could see. So that's all I have for you. Questions of the commission? So what, so you're here for what? Well, Rick says that, I believe Mr. Rochelle says that anything other than karaoke is not permitted there. So we can't have any other type of entertainment. And what I'm saying is the state of Connecticut might say that, but not to allow us to do that, that's not a local issue. That's off the table here. 
since you've already told us we can have entertainment, if we wanted to go in and change our, our permit or do or check another box at the state level, then we should be able to do that. Mr. Chairman, I would like to hear from the zoning of, enforcement of course. first before we start ch chatting. Sure, uh, Madam Secretary. Uh, Rick. Okay, so uh, in September of uh, 22, we started getting complaints regarding the parking issues uh, that were going on there, and that led to the finding that the only liquor permit that was issued, and it, there was one that was signed in 2015 by the uh, zoning enforcement officer at the time, uh, but only the box for karaoke was checked off. Um, there are other boxes there that include live entertainment, which includes disc jockey and live bands. Uh, that's not the case here. Um, a change to that would require them to go back to PNZ. Well, I should say they ha would have to go to PNZ for an approval for that change. The, there is no special permit. There was no approvals that I could ever find for the actual initial issuance of a liquor permit and approval for a liquor permit for the business. Um, so that's kind of where we, we stand. Um, as I said, the change would require us to sign off in zoning, but if it's a change, it would have to go before PNZ for an additional approval to that change. Just signing off karaoke doesn't mean live entertainment. That's why there's boxes several boxes on the application for the Liquor Commission. So I'm a little confused. Okay. You have a liquor permit that has a checkbox for karaoke. At the state level, correct. And you could have picked other things but didn't. Yes, and I, my client can explain why, why he okay. did Okay, and like yep. you could go to back to planning and zoning and communicate with them that you want this additional change because the way I understand our zoning rules from my 2007 opportunity of sitting at this table yes. is that if it's silent, it's no. If it's silent, if it's, it's silent, yeah, it's no. Right. But there, so if but we it's didn't, not, it's not silent on this issue. Well, it's, I, I took notes. Yep. And it's pretty silent. Because you, uh, you, you've, you've gone through 1941, 1966, 1975, oh, 1986 oh. to 2001 to 2000, and yeah, 2001 your stop. And it was pretty much silent. So that would mean that he would have to have a license or a yeah. permit. Yes. He did fill out the permit. Right. And he did check karaoke. When right. he had the opportunity to get other types, he really and truly, ZBA's job is to hear the cease and desist. I believe that's what we're here for, but yes, it's not. Yeah. It is not to do planning and zoning's job. Well, I'm not asking you to. I'm asking you to overturn a cease and desist because we have permission from the town to have entertainment there. You have permission from the town. Did you go in and have, it says here, liquor permits with any entertainment. Do you have a special permit for that? No, there are no special permits at all because liquor has been sold at that location. Nope, you since have a liquor before. permit. I'm yep. looking at section 5.20, yep. table 520. Yeah. Liquor permits, special right. permit. Right. You're a BL zone? Yes. Okay. You have a special permit for a liquor permit? No. You did not? No. No one's ever gotten a special permit at that location. Including this person? Right. So then he shouldn't be selling alcohol at all? No. Your, your, your town official signed the permit application saying that, and it, that liquor can be served at this location. It with doesn't karaoke, violate the zoning location. With karaoke. With entertainment. And, and again. Right. You're, you're, I know what you're saying, but we're, and, I'm, and I, I know you get, you know. There's no differentiation in your regulations between what entertainment means, whether it's one type of entertainment or a different type. We have a permit from the sign off on an application to the state for a permit that allows us to have entertainment. For karaoke. That's what, the, from the state's position, yes. 
Okay. So we might need to go back to them if we wanted to enlarge it, or we might not. But I'm saying to tell me that essentially what he's what we're hearing is we don't have the right to have entertainment there. And I'm saying that's the basis of the cease and desist, and I'm telling you that from our position that's inaccurate. That's not true. Because you didn't start regulating alcohol permits until 66. Yeah. And then you didn't start regulating differences between alcohol permits with entertainment and with non-entertainment until 2001. Which means something must have happened, Mr. Leandolita, that got people to have to fix our regulations. That's always and you the know case. Who, and you know who writes those regulations? Planning and zoning. Right. Okay. Mr. Chairman? Mr. Stroni. Um, you mentioned in the beginning that you, well, I should say you acknowledge that the prior owner had the same type of um, entertainment and permit. Right. But you yourself also said that that doesn't carry over by property, much like other permitting approvals. The liquor license. The liquor license does not carry over, so each new business would have to apply for a new one. For this from the state. And, and forgive me, I'm newer to this board. Yeah. A couple of years now. Yeah. So I don't have the experience that um, Commissioner Turner has, but I'm looking at the permit and only one box is checked with right. a whole bunch of other options. Sure. So I'm confused because the town, and this is what was signed by the town and approved by the town. Right. Which is, as was submitted by, I believe your client, it says karaoke. Right. No other boxes. Understood. And yes. that's what it's the state. Factually, that's true. Based, well. Fact, it, it is the facts. It's yeah. on the form. Yeah. And then the state issues the liquor permit based on that approval, which in turn says entertainment karaoke no. with no other endorsements. But you have to, if you read the statement that the town signs, all right, it the says. The approval, right. though, is sure. based on what your client would have submitted, which is purely karaoke. Correct. And I believe your client has the ability to, to update and modify that without waiting for the liquor license to expire by going through planning and zoning, submitting a new form well, for consideration. We don't think we have to go to planning and zoning, and there are reasons why we don't want to, but we don't have to, because this license predates the 2001 change in your regulations that differentiated between licenses with entertainment and without entertainment. With exception to that statement, the the license that your client was issued does not predate that. No, Mike. No, of course not. Right. But so the license that was applied for yeah. was well after the changes to the requirements for liquor licenses, types of licenses, et cetera. Correct. And and that's where I'm stuck here. Yep. Because in my mind, and, and maybe I'm simplifying, it should just be submitting a new liquor license with the appropriate type of entertainment your client wants. And this would be resolved without any issue. Well, with them, but you'd have to go back to planning and zoning. Well, for a special I, permit. I, yeah. I don't. I don't think that's the the argument that they're making. And yeah. I think what what they're saying is that the use is continued. Right. That's what that's what you're yeah, saying. In other it's words, been a continuous when license, use. Ownership change. Ownership but, changes. You don't go back to planning and zoning and ask for. Uh, you go because it's been in continuous use. Right? You just renew the permit. You sign, get a sign off. You don't have to go back to planning and zoning every time. So the first time it's approved, it's sort of like, you know, well, I would, it's not like a garage, but it, 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 except garages, you know, automobile places, you have every time they have to come back here. And in some towns, they just sign off and they don't even require or they give the zoning enforcement officer. But I'm saying with liquor licenses, if I have a package store and I sell my package store, which happens all the time, I hand my application to the zoning enforcement officer and he says it's been a package store for 30 years, he signs it. You don't go back to planning and zoning to get permission to open a package store at that facility. It's a continuous operation. So, and I'm looking at the document and you checked, and the previous I, owner said karaoke. Right. Which the is, current owner says karaoke. Yeah. You had other choices. We did, and it's a form of entertainment. And you got karaoke. Yep. But there's 
He's had bands, the prior owners had bands, under the theme that this is all entertainment. Uh, Vice Chair Noble. Uh, I'm a little confused as well. I think <laughs> okay. we all are at this point. But going back through it, uh, I think that was, uh, Mr. Rochelle, I believe was signed um, by the CEO in 2015 for that license. Am I That's right? correct. Okay. And we have copies of uh, licenses after that going up to 2023, I believe, July. That's correct. Okay. Yeah, it's renewed every year. Right. It's renewed every year, which is, which is fine. Yeah. But it, it, on the bottom of the, on the license, it says karaoke. My, my guess is, is that you could have, uh, if you wanted to change it, have it be clear that that's what it was, mm -hmm. any one of those annual renewals, you could have applied to the state to change it to one of the other choices that are there. I, I'm just, I, so because you didn't and you want to change it now, mm -hmm. that, I, I believe that's the reason you'd have to go for the change to go to uh, planning and zoning. I, I don't know what the issues are for not going, but I, yeah. you know, that's up to you. But well, uh, it seems that if you're going to change what's been in there for the, like, the last six, seven, eight years. So, then, yeah, yeah, I understand. Okay. And you're, you're questioning why I just don't do that because yeah. you think it's maybe a path of least resistance. I'm telling you I don't need to do it. I, if I want to do it because I can, doesn't mean that I need to do it. I'm saying that since the only license they give are licenses with or without entertainment, and we have license to serve alcohol with entertainment, I don't need to go back there. And maybe this is an argument for another day. But I, I, I suspect, and the reason we're here, is if my client was to fill out that new form and check all of the live in comedians or whatever you know, is on that thing, and he brought it to the town, you've heard what the zoning enforcement officer says he's going to do. He's going to reject it. I didn't hear yeah, because he say says that. he's gonna. He needs. We need to go. We're changing the use because he thinks the use is karaoke, and I think this is where we're getting hung up. The use is not karaoke. The use is entertainment because karaoke is not mentioned in your regulations. Entertainment is. That's the use that's been in existence and approved by this town. Mm -hmm. That's that's my argument. Thank you, Attorney. Uh, question through to staff: Would would that be the case that you would deny? No, th this is actually from the uh, state consumer protection adding live entertainment. And if a, if requesting an amendment to the live entertainment at a permitted location, the permittee must obtain the approval of the municipal zoning approval. That's so that good. wouldn't be from us. That wouldn't be from me. That would have to go back before because it's a change. Yeah. It's a change in the use. There, there's never been an approval. I, at my level, cannot approve that. That would have to go before the Planning, zone, uh, planning and Zoning Commission for a change. And to the chairman, to the ZEO, so my question is, uh, the documents I have in front of me shows that they have a liquor permit, right? And I'm, and I'm going to use K-7 as my example, right? So with K-7s, they come in front of us, we do whatever we do. The, that K-7 now comes back to the planning office and then secretary signs off. And then for that automotive use, they have to ch choose general or repair or whatever at the top. And you know, I always, I'm very cognizant of watching the box checking, right? I'm seeing the same thing here. I'm seeing the exact same thing. If this type of liquor permit comes to the planning and zoning office and the ZEO is signing off, they're under the guided guides of that it's going to be for karaoke, I don't believe that the ZEO did anything other than read what was in front of them per this one's Pizza Palace, but isn't the liquor permit the document? I mean, like the K-7 is for the, the repairs license? Correct. And on the liquor right. permit application, the actual one that goes before, there's a box for live entertainment. Correct. It says the type of live entertainment. It ranges from acoustics, disc jockeys, live bands, comedians, exotic dancers, concerts, karaoke, plays and shows, sporting events, magicians. So um, they won't have all these boxes on, on here unless there was a reason for that. Correct. That's what I'm seeing. So it's not that the, the office has a specific license that it's through your liquor license and then it's part of Correct. the package that we get from planning. A absolutely. I, okay. I agree. But 
again, well, I've made my point. You don't differentiate between types of entertainment. Entertainment is entertainment. You're, you're, you're really pulling that gum for me, Mr. <laughs> Leandalina. It yeah. says specific types of entertainment. Mm -hmm. There's opportunities for the applicant to choose, and they could choose many. Right. And they didn't. And so I think we're in front of us. You're asking us to do what? We can't change what you wrote on the liquor permit. It doesn't matter because it's all entertainment and you don't No, it's it. your interpretation. Yeah. That, I'm reading. That, that's what, that's, this is my, you know. Okay. You know, this is my argument and to you and I, I you know, it's, I, I, I think it's a reasonable one based upon the language in your regulations and the way you, we've led up to this over the course of decades. But you're the arbiter here, I, I you know. You'll make a decision, and we'll decide how to react from there. Further questions of the commission? Further questions to staff? Further questions of the applicant? Anything? Okay. All right. So uh, we'll sit back until I'm sure there are other people here who'd like to uh, discuss this. Seems likely, but we don't know. We'll find out. <laughs> <laughs> Is there anyone in the audience that wishes to address us concerning this appeal? Yes, sir. Please come up and state your name and address for the record. Mr. Chairman, just yes. a request. Could you just clarify for the audience the nature, just reread the appeal so that it's focused on that? Is that possible? I mean, they're, they're, the comments would be pertaining to the appeal. They're they're allowed to have okay. their, their freedom to, okay. to speak. I mean, they're not speaking in favor of a variance. It's it's an appeal. So, whatever testimony they think they can offer, we'll we'll let them. Robert Bukowski, 21 Francis Avenue. Um, good evening, Chairman and Board members. My presentation tonight. I was concerned about the time, so I thought I'd tell you up front that it's not going to matter. My presentation is going to take nine minutes, and I uh, now I'll say only nine minutes. Um, I'd like to first state <clears throat> that I'm opposed to DJ entertainment at Jimmy's Pub at this time. I'm also opposed to karaoke and live band entertainment as well at this time. Um, if I understand this correctly, this this is basically. Does he continue on with karaoke, or is he allowed through one avenue or another to also do uh, DJ entertainment legally within, within, within the scope of whatever the town rules are? So that's where it starts getting applicable. That, that's where it starts getting important to me um, as a resident of Francis Avenue. I look at, um, I look at DJ entertainment and um, live entertainment, band entertainment, and even karaoke as the same thing related to parking. All of these things present a very bad problem for Francis Avenue. Um, when, when Jimmy's Pub was just a little lazy little bar like Jiggy's and Cloverleaf, there has been no problem since 1865 uh, with regards to Jimmy's Pub. After 2022, there, there, there are some significant problems. So let me, let me stick to my program here. Um, we have some major parking problems in our neighborhood, especially on Francis Avenue. Could, um, could I interrupt your testimony just for a, a bit? Uh, we're, we're not here to discuss parking, and we don't have the power to control parking. So if you could maybe refocus your comments or give us the part of the presentation concerned with this as an appeal, whether we should be upholding the cease and desist order or overturning it. Well, I, I understand that, and I have a paragraph here addressing that. Let me read that to you, and then I'll respect whatever you say. Um, I understand that some of this information is best presented to the town council, some to PNZ, and some to you. But better to be a little more thorough than less and I want to provide the complete story. But, but if, if DJ entertainment is allowed, it directly affects parking 
So I'm against the DJ entertainment, and I simply like to say why. Most of my presentation is, I'll, I'll be happy to skip as best I can, most of my presentation is about, and I'll, is about some zoning specs that I'll outline in just a minute. I'll try to keep the parking to, to a minimum, okay. or not at all, if I can. Um, okay. Uh, these issues properly. <clears throat> I'll be making my argument against DJ and live band entertainment based on the following zoning regulations. Obviously, 5.20, I agree with the information in the master packet, but also Article 10, uh, Section 10.00, Purposes, Table 10.10.2, .10 Parking Standards, whoops, uh, Article 9, Site Plan and Special Permit Standards and Procedures, Section 9.10.4, Paragraph B, site plan approval criteria. Um, I'd like to present a police activity report which provides hard data on police activity. Part of this is quality of life issue, okay? Every, everything I say, well, parking is really a quality of life issue and it all relates to the regulations that, I, that I've just stated. Um, there's some serious quality of life issues on, on Francis Avenue. Hard to separate parking from that but, but the issues are really the disorderly conduct that occurs on our street. So I do have uh, police activity reports, just one, that I'd like to present to you. Um, sure, if you could hand that to staff so he could stamp that in for the record. My neighbor also has, will be coming up, uh, a petition of uh, 26 names that, uh, sorry, but it's, it, it's resident parking only. <laughs> and. Um, and also uh, some pictures of uh, the, the, the things that the neighbors have to put up with at 2.30 in the morning. So I don't know if uh, I can present that or she can come up after me. All, all of your stuff. Yeah, I've, oh. uh, anybody that's here to speak will be recognized. So if you want to do your presentation okay. and she wants to speak, all right. we're, we'll recognize her. She um, she yeah, she because you talk better than I do. Okay, I talk better than she does. she doesn't want to. All right. So here's the pictures. This is what the neighborhood is faced with. And this is not really a parking issue. It's it, just Excuse it's me. Issue. You have to stay on the microphone so the public can hear you. Or, so if you need if to you hand need to the pick, stuff to the, they can send it to us. You can I pick will, up um, that remote the, mic if you These are more about disorderly issues, obviously related to parking because they park on our street before they become disorderly. But this is what people have to endure at up to 2.30 in the morning, uh, even with parking ban in effect. Um, and uh, you may, may or may not want to see the petition because that is just parking. Um, let's see, uh, live ban. Jimmy's Pub renovated in 2022 and started to have live band entertainment unpermitted. This created a tremendous disorderly conduct problem on our streets. Uh, and after a community meeting at the pub, the town council voted for a, sorry, four month temporary parking ban due to the disorderly conduct. Uh, we're now on our second round of that four month ban. Um, I realize most of this is, is better, um, better stated to the uh, planning and zoning uh, because if I understand it correctly, there, the permitting is a two-step process, first through the town, second through the, the Liquor Commission. And, and if I understand it correctly, any change change in use, meaning going from karaoke to, to DJ, requires the sign-off at planning and zoning. So I just wanted to uh, give everybody as much of a background as I could, but I respect uh, the chairman's uh, point of view. Um, section 10.00 of the uh, Planning and Zoning Code, quote, 
The purpose of this article is to guide site development activities to assure that such activities are conducted in a manner that protects the health, safety, and general welfare of the citizens of Enfield." Unquote. So um, to summarize it, um, all of the bad activity that occurs on our street really is just flies in the face of this. Um, <clears throat> Francis Avenue is a narrow 25-foot street, poorly lit with no sidewalks. Um, we've got lots of people on the street. Um, it's just a bad idea. Um, let's see. Then there's Article 9. I don't know if Article 9. Yeah, I think Article 9 is appropriate to speak of here. Um, Article 9, Section 9.10.4, Paragraph B. <laughs> Um, no, that's more about parking, I'm sorry. All right, in summary, <laughs> please do not allow any additional entertainment at Jimmy's Pub until all of these issues are adequately resolved. That's it. Um, so you've got the pictures, um, you, want, you don't need the petition, and I've given you the uh, police report regarding all of the uh, disorderly conduct, parking tickets, and everything else. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Mm -mm. Um, just, I'll have you say, just for the record, that there's a bunch of pictures from. Yeah, can we get these back? Just going to take a second and let the secretary identify for the record uh, a summary of all these items we've received. Do I have them all? Yes, you do. Three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven, twelve, thirteen, fourteen, fifteen, sixteen, seventeen. Um, there are seventeen documents with photos of the area. There are three manila folders breaking down. Um, with more photos in them. And there is a police report uh, dated April 3rd, 2023. Can we get those photos back? Yep. Thank you. Is there anyone else in the audience that wishes to address us uh, concerning this appeal. Going once, going twice. Okay. Does the applicant wish to, appellant rather, wish to make a final comment? No, Mr. Chairman. We're all set. Thank you. Thank you. Do we have any uh, motion on the floor? I make a motion to close the cease. Do we call it an appeal? I make a motion to close the appeal. Sorry. Yeah. All those in favor? Opposed? Abstain? Okay. Now the hearing's closed. Um, do we have a motion to uphold? I guess would right. be the Right. So let's, let's make sure we're all on the same page. Uphold means that you uphold what the ZEO has written. And if you say no, then you say no to the ZEO, correct, Mr. Chairman? That is correct. We have to make our motion in the affirmative. I make a motion for ZBA 2023-0303-500-524 Enfield Street, appeal of the cease and desist order for Section 5.20 Business Districts Use. Do you need the rest of the document, Mr. ZEO, for the, do you want the rest of this? I mean, I mean, I think we've read it into right. the record, so you identified the, the appeal that you're making a motion on, so you can mm -hmm. go forward to your motion. Okay, so I make a motion that we uphold the ZEO's cease and desist for um, 500-524 Enfield Street. 
Do we have a second? No, second. Uh, is there a discussion? Yes. Okay. So that would only be for other entertainment. He still gets to keep the karaoke. I think that's correct. correct. I think the, the argument's been presented to us that there's field preemption here because the use had been open and ongoing prior to the inaction of the regulation. So that's, that's the argument that the appellant is making. The argument that staff is making is that the document on its face confines the use and it's been karaoke and it doesn't seem there's any dispute as to that. But that should be built into this, shouldn't it? Like, like it should be spelled out. I mean, I th I, there, in, there's two ways to do a motion. You could do the motion where the maker spells out exactly his or her reasons for upholding. The other way that you could do the motion is just to uphold, and then each person, as they vote, can, can state their reason. So if we're all, if we have a, a, an agreement on what that might look like, or at least the maker of the motion and the second of the motion, uh, you could I, you could give the reason right I would give my reason when I vote because that yeah either way you guys want to do it and just to clarify um, this upholds it as it is right now it's not us changing anything well if we say no to him then anything can happen if we uphold him they have karaoke okay does that answer the question yes. right we're not doing anything to the liquor permit so my motion is is uphold the appeal of the the, the cease and desist for, for the 500 524 Enfield Street and, and the thing is Rick I don't have anything specifically saying the liquor permit or anything I don't usually I have something in front of me um, you should have this the cease and desist order This will probably clear it up. <sighs> Mr. Chairman, just a quick point of order. I'm, I'm not seated, correct? Just want to verify that? Correct. Okay. okay, so I'd like to amend my motion to make sure that it's clear for Mr. Uh, Master Birdie. So uh, the cease and desist from all activities and uses which are contrary to the regulations contained in the zoning off ordinance of the town for sections 5.20 business district table and take corrective action required being the property into compliance with applicable regulations cease and desist from all entertainment other than karaoke for which you have been provided for a license section 522 5.20 business district use table restaurant footnote number two liquor permits so I'll second that uh, amended motion or change motion Right. Maybe that just clears it up. I think it does. Further discussion? Okay. You want a roll call vote? Yes, let's let's do a, a roll call, Madam Secretary, on this. Andrew Abanowitz. Uh, yes. Tim Neville? Yes. Mary Ann Turner, yes. Kelly Davis? Yes. Charlie Masterverde. Yes. Yes, I do. Just got to make sure I have the right one. Okay. Holding the cease and desist of the DEO order, and we'll just keep this from all entertainment other than correct. Okay, because the 
the karaoke is what we've said uh, is the, the pre-existing and conforming continuous use. Okay, so it says upholding the cease and desist of the ZEO order from all entertainment other than karaoke for which 500 524 Enfield Street has been approved. Okay? Correct. So. clear up this mess. I don't know how planning and zoning does it. Well, that's why I tried to bring the binder, but I think it's just made it messier. So. <laughs> okay, this will put up our hands here so that goes back. It doesn't get blended. Okay. Right, and you have our legal, you have the legal notice there. Uh, moving on in our agenda. Uh, Madam Secretary, please read the legal notice. The Enfield Zoning Board of Appeal will hold a public hearing on Monday, May, April 24, 2030, excuse me, 2023 at 7 p.m. in the council chambers at 10 at the town hall located 820 Enfield Street, Enfield, Connecticut, concerning ZBA 2023-0320-65 Park Ave. Appeal of notice of violation of sections 3.30.7 SS4 accessory building and section 4.10.3 specific requirements for non-conforming lots. Adam Hall, applicant owner, map 39, lot 27, R33 zone. Okay, is the appellant here? Mr. Hall, please come forward and state your name and address for the record. Yes, I am Adam Hall. I am the owner of 65 Park Avenue. Um, good evening, Chairman and members of the board. Uh, <clears throat> so, to me, <clears throat> excuse me, to me, my backyard is just that. It's my backyard. You know, where my backyard abuts Westford Avenue is a part of my yard that's furthest from my house that is on Park Ave. <clears throat> no one can build a house back there, so I never even considered that my backyard would have frontage on a street that's not my address. Once the zoning officer informed me that my property was classified as a through lot and explained to me why it was, I realized my error. Um, as you all read in the letter that I wrote um, that's in the master packet, I'm, I'm sure, I, I reached out to the building department to find out if I needed a building permit. I found out that I did not if I kept it under 200 square feet. And I also knew that there might be some zoning restrictions, so I looked up the zoning regulations online. And if I was not a through lot, I believe I did adhere to the zoning codes. It was never my intention to knowingly build anything in violation of town codes. I was trying to follow the rules, and I just seemed to miss a step. Um, not only is the greenhouse a very long time dream of my wife and I, but especially in today's economy, I'm seeing it as almost a necessity for my family. You know, we are a family of four, my wife and I and my two growing children who eat like crazy. And my wife has quite a few dietary restrictions. One of the big ones is no gluten or rice. Now, I don't know if any of you have a gluten intolerance, but not only is it hard to find food in the grocery store, um, that is gluten free, but now you add no rice and it's almost impossible to find something, uh, some food that she can eat. So because of that, those foods become much more expensive than your normal processed poison that's sold in our grocery stores. It's not uncommon to spend $250 a week on groceries. $1,000 a month is making it hard to keep our heads above water. And we have had a vegetable garden for many years, but we can't grow food in the winter. With a greenhouse, I could feed my family through the whole year and reduce our ridiculous grocery bill. 
The greenhouse is not even complete, but I was able to finish it enough before it got too cold to grow some foods over the past winter. We grew a few types of, <clears throat> excuse me, lettuce, kale, carrots, parsnips, garlic, onions, snap peas, and we kept growing herbs all winter long. It allowed our blueberry and kiwi to start blooming earlier, and we started our seeds early for the vegetable garden to ensure we have hardy plants for this year's crop. We have only been able to use a small portion of the greenhouse so far, but it has made quite a difference already. And we have always shared our excess harvest with our neighbors, and we hope with the addition of the greenhouse that we can give even more to our neighborhood. Now, we spent many years collecting the windows to repurpose for the greenhouse, and we picked a spot in our yard that gets the most sun and is elevated enough to stay mostly dry, because, you know, why wouldn't you? I built it myself for the most part in my spare time, and it took me most of the year to build it. So after thousands of dollars in lumber and materials and almost a year of blood, sweat, and tears, my hard work and dream are in jeopardy because I regrettably missed a step in the process. This has been devastating because I really thought I was doing everything right. Had I gone to zoning first, I would have appeared in front of this council to ask for a variance for the through lot zoning code before constructing the greenhouse. So basically, after the fact, I'm asking for that now. As I'm sure you all can clearly see from the pictures I have in the master packet, the area in my backyard, which would be approved by the zoning code, is not a feasible area to put a greenhouse, or any building for that matter. For that area to sustain a building would need many corrections done by me and the town. First, I would have to remove two trees in that area, since, and since that area already floods, removing those trees that are sucking up much of that water would create more flooding in that area. I would also need to spend thousands of dollars to have my neighbor's giant maple tree trimmed back so it would not completely shade that area, because that area doesn't get any sun. A greenhouse in, a sh in the shade is useless, so that area would need to be filled in to raise the yard up so that it doesn't flood because it's a big low spot. And if I raise that area, then it would affect the flow of the water, diverting it into my neighbor's property, and who knows how bad that could become. It would also affect the drainage system that's, ins that's been installed by the town, so now the town would have to redo the drainage system to make it work properly. And it seems awfully costly and risky for both me and the town just to adhere to the code, especially when it seems that a vast majority of my neighbors don't seem to have a problem with the greenhouse where it is. In fact, I was told by many of my neighbors that I have a petition that signed with 27 signatures, um, told by most of my neighbors that signed my petition that they love my greenhouse and think it's a great addition to the neighborhood and don't see a problem with it. If this is not considered a hardship, I'm not really sure what is. Um, it's my hope that this council will find the location of my greenhouse acceptable and grant me a variance in order to keep my greenhouse at its current location. And I thank you all for your time and your consideration with this issue. Um, nope. I do have a copy of the petition. I went around to the uh, two dead end streets that kind of come up to my property and on Park Ave, so just really my surrounding neighbors. I really didn't even go through the whole neighborhood, but, um, and I did get 27 signatures. Um, pretty much everybody on the road that the greenhouse is on signed it. Um, I also have a letter from another resident. Um, there was a, a pretty lengthy letter written by Michael Riveruzzi in the master packet. I don't know if you saw that, but it was a handwritten letter. Um, so I sure assume you all read that. I won't buy up any more time reading that. But uh, yeah, I just uh, kind of here falling on the sword and really hoping that I can keep my greenhouse where it is. Ask a question to staff first. Staff, um, he's he's here on an appeal tonight. Uh, has he had any conversations with you about a variance, or you know, requesting a variance? I think initially when he uh, came in, there was a discussion as to what avenue he would have to take, um, but uh, he chose to go with the appeal of the cease and desist. Oh, I'm sorry, appeal appeal of the uh, notice of violation. 
Yeah, I wasn't but quite was sure exactly if that's right. the way I needed to go or not. He, but. he could, in theory, have a variance request running concurrent with the appeal. He could. He just but he elected didn't. not to. He did. It's, it's the appeal of the notice of violation. Right. I'm sorry. I kind of thought that was almost the same thing. I'm, this is nowhere near my forte, and, and legal documentation does confuse me. Um, as far as uh, the notice of violation, you know, for the section 30 point or 3.30.7, the accessory buildings, you know, when I read that, you know, accessory buildings are located in the following standards. These standards can waive um, that, you know, it says the residential districts and Thompsonville districts shall be located behind the line established by the rear of the principal building on the lot and shall be located at least five feet from both rear and side lines. Um, that's what I thought I was adhering to. You know, like I said, I was very confused that I had frontage on another street when that's a backyard, you know, and I do understand now that, that that's the way it is, but, um, you know, that kept me from reading further. I thought further was com commercial industrial districts, but, uh, you know, they kind of put in the through lot thing in the middle of that. And then as far as the uh, 40.10.3, special requirements for legal nonconforming lots that says I'm in violation of, um, that seems to be more of an actual home or a building, you know, talking not an accessory building because it doesn't even meet those qualifications. You know, this is gives you uh, 1,200 square feet and um, two stories. You know, that's not the accessory building thing. That's supposed to be under 200 square feet and 15 feet um, and says, you know, five feet from any rear lot line when this this code says uh, front and rear 35 feet. So it kind of contradicts what the accessory building is. And this leads me to believe that this section doesn't really apply to my building and my lot. But. Okay. <laughs> Staff, you look like you have something to say to me. <laughs> no, I was just going to say, even with, it, it, I don't even know the size of the actual greenhouse. I, that hasn't been made clear. Oh, it's 19 feet by 10 feet. So it's 190 square feet. So, so even with that being said, under the regulations, if it's under 200 square feet, even by right having an accessory building under that size, it still requires a zoning permit. Um, had he come in with a zoning permit application, we would have denied it because it was in the frontage of the um, Westford Street. So that that's when I would have been able to ask for a variance in that code. Is, is that? That would have been an alternative for you. Okay. You said you think could do that concurrently. Yeah. We could table this. Right. He has a file. Do you have uh, any intention of filing for a variance? If that's what it takes to to go, then I absolutely would. I, I honestly thought like this is basically what I was doing was asking for a variance here. No, because I thought it was different. a I thought it was a violation of the code, and I was coming here to ask for a variance of that code no. to up to relieve the violation. Just so you understand, all we can do is focus on what's in front of us. Sure. And what's in front of us is a violation. Okay. So we will only be able to act on that. If you want to ha go further, you're going to have to file back with the planning office for a zoning request for a variance, and that's a whole different thing that we do. Okay, because when I yeah when I asked for about the avenues, day. that's that's what I was told was I could apply for an appeal, and I, I was I thought that was all the same thing. Um, I can understand. You know, you we certainly, he, yeah, I mean, you could request that we table this so you can file a variance request. I would absolutely request that then. But on the other hand, if we just finish this business, it doesn't jeopardize him to go back and ask for the variance. It's no. not that they're contingent. To, I would just finish To the extent this. of enforcement only, because he has a building 
that's right. there. So right, and we would do. My suggestion would be is like we've done in the past. We've we finished the business at hand, but we delay any uh, fines until you've moved to the next step till our next meeting. If you follow through on that and you come back in front of us, we'll take it up under advisement again. Then we move forward. If you don't show up, well, then <laughs> he's going to show up at your door. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. Yeah, that's certainly a possibility too. So. Um, an open public hearing. Yeah, we can continue on with the hearing. Is there anyone uh, in the audience that wishes to address us? Uh, concerning this appeal. You, ma'am, please uh, come up and state your name and address for the record. Good evening, Chairman and members of the board. My name is Courtney Malloy, and I live at 10 Harrison Avenue. When I moved to Enfield Town two years ago, Adam and his wife were one of the first people to welcome me in. Now that I see that we are moving forward with discussions about the greenhouse, I would love to rant and rave about how wonderful it is for the town's children, the neighborhood children. But if that's if we're tabling this uh, situation for today, then I will not take up more of your time. Um, but I just wanted to say hello and that this is a great idea. And for the next time that we come in, I'll make sure to tell you of what a great idea it is for the children who live in our neighborhood. Okay. Thank you. Is there anyone else in the audience that wishes to address this appeal? Going once, twice. Okay, Hear, hearing nobody else, uh, the applicant can come back forward. Do you have, if you have any final comment, this would be the time. Um, nope, I just appreciate you guiding me in the right direction. Thank you. We have a. Uh, I make a motion to close the public hearing and the, hang on, sorry, I always never have all my paperwork in front of me. Is this is, this is the appeal of notice of violation. Okay, all those in favor? Okay, the hearing's closed. Do we have discussion? I think we discussed during the meeting maybe that we would stay enforcement or request that it stayed so he could file. I make a motion to uphold the appeal of the notice of violation for 65 Park Avenue, sections 3.30.7 SS4 accessory building and section 4.10.3. Second. Okay. You want a roll let's, call? Yeah, let's do a roll call, please. And remember, a yes upholds and a no overturns. Andrew Abanowitz. Yes. Tim Neville. Yes. Mary Ann Turner. Yes. Kelly Davis. Yes. Carly Masterbirdie. Yes. Uh, just for the record, I was handed a petition and a, a letter, um, which I will hand for you to put to the file. Oops. Okay. Let's make sure I get the right one. Tim, did you second it? Yes, I did. all set now right yeah oh yeah you 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 can uh you can, you can leave sorry <laughs> so i'm just putting on this one we're just upholding the notice of violation to 65 park ave is that enough or do you want more and and requesting enforcement be stayed to yep. allow a variance application Uphold the notice of violation to 65 Park Avenue and request enforcement to be stayed waiting for the zoning enforce uh, variance paperwork. Will that work? Yeah, I mean, what, what did we say? We were going to ask for, what, 30 days or something? 30, uh, 30 days. Yeah. That should give you enough time? Yeah. Do 
you want us to hold on to these documents? Or will we just get new ones? Uh, we, we can give them to you, and then you could repackage them. Why don't you just hold on to them? You're going to get them again anyway. Right, because it's got all the photos and stuff. Yeah. So that will be up. All right. Agenda, Tim, you're going to take over as chairman for this one. You're going to tell him? Yeah. Thank you very yeah. much. I appreciate it. Okay. Uh, Madam Secretary, please read the legal notice. ZBA 2023-04-10-110 Raffia Road Appeal of Cease and Desist Order for Section 4.20 Residential Uses Raffia Farms Inc. Applicant Owner Map 67 Lot 432 R33 Zone. Okay. Uh, before we, well, I welcome the uh, app, the appellants forward. And for the record, I will be recusing myself from this matter as I have provided legal counsel to the appellant and some of that in connection with this matter. Um, in my absence, Rich Stroney will serve as a full voting member, and Vice Chairman Neville will take my place as chair of the meeting. Good evening. Good evening, Mr. Chair and members of the board. Again, for the record, Attorney Carl Landolina, Fahey and Landolina, 487 Spring Street, Windsor Locks, Connecticut. Um, uh, joined uh, tonight by my client, uh, Gary Raffia, who is the principal of Raffia Farms, Inc. Uh, just a housekeeping matter. Um, my client, uh, we had a discussion. We, there must have been some miscommunication. Um, he gave notice to everybody in the world, as you can see in the packet. And it turned out there was only seven necessary notices, but the, the seven that were ne necessary are included in, in, uh, in your packet. We also gave notice. So uh, those who, under the statutes, were required to be given notice um, have received notice, and I'll provide at least certification of of notice that our office gave from the post office my client sent i think return receipt requested to everybody or yes. yeah certified mail yeah, so certified. yep and we've also placed a sign in the property as required under the zoning regulations and um there's an affidavit uh, in the file to that effect and the sign's still there right mm -hmm. and the sign is still there I'm sorry. The sign is still there. Yes, it yeah. is. Mm -hmm. My client tells her the sign is still up in accordance with the regulations. So before we get into the, um, as part of the application, we did file a number of uh, letters, um, which we are an attempt to outline to this board why we think that uh, this is a non-conforming use. Um, I also sent to staff at uh, about a week ago uh, a number of other documents, some of which may be duplicative of the documents that were attached to the application itself, but there are a number of letters describing in some detail uh, recollections, uh, firsthand knowledge, and uh, other things related to how long this building has been in its current location and how it's been used over the years that it's been there. One thing I'd like to talk about um, initially, though, would be to have a brief discussion on burden of proof. So a lot of times legal matters get resolved on who has the burden of proof and whether they they uh, sustain their burden and prove one set of facts versus another set of facts. 
when we start talking about burden of proof in a non-conforming use case, as time goes on, that proof gets a little less first-hand knowledge and more second or third hand or those kinds of things. Um, the regulations here in town go back to 1925, which is 98 years ago. There's no one in this room that was around in 1925. And I suspect there was no one, there's no one in this room that was, I could be wrong, that was around when this building was constructed, uh, we believe sometime in the 30s. That's as far back as we can trace it at this point. So the, the reason I bring this up is that when it comes to non-conforming uses, you, you know the law is that it must have been legal at the time that it first took place. And the other big thing is it must be known a known use in the community. Now, not something that wasn't hidden, it's, you know, everybody knew, or many people in the community knew that there was a building there and how it was used. Our claim is that it's been used commercially since the time it was constructed. It's never been used as a uh, residential uh, building since its inception. So, um, we, we think with the evidence we're about to give you, to the extent that we have the burden, we think we can meet that burden. Um, the danger, though, that time creates for this kind of uh, question is that if I have to have somebody here with firsthand knowledge or other things that might, you know, 50 years from now, I could go back 100 years and there's clear records of things. The records in most places from you know, 1910, 1920, 1930 are very spotty, and this town is no different. So we have records that are obtainable. We have, we're gonna have documents that we have, and you, you know, we can go through them. But the danger is that someone who doesn't like what's going on currently, this is hypothetically, can get the attention of the zoning enforcement officer by calling and writing and, you know, and all of a sudden the zoning enforcement officer, this is hypothetically, issues a cease and desist to throw it to somebody else, i.e. you guys, and now you have a chance of upholding that cease and desist because I can't show you a building permit from 1930-something. I can't show you, I can't bring anyone here who tells you, oh, yeah, I remember when I was five years old. My grandfather worked on uh, the construction of that building. I can't do any of those things. So you have, I think within reason you have to use, you know, your powers of deductive and, and infer things, you know, from where we go. So with that in mind, let's talk about the history of your zoning regulations like we did last time. Hopefully I'll make it a little more clear than I attempted to it seven o'clock. As I say, your regulations first started in 1925. The first evidence of the Zoning Commission having meetings, the first evidence, is 1941. Now, I'm not saying they didn't do anything between 1925 and 1941, but that's as far back as your records go with respect to minutes of meetings. Your Zoning Commission meetings, I'm sorry, 1938. So the Zoning Commission, the, the only records that can be found in this building for minutes start in 1938 and go to 1942. Then they drop off the map. Don't exist. Your Planning Commission has minutes from 1941 to 1957, but not the Zoning Commission. But this is a zoning matter, not a planning matter. And this is not unusual. Um, you know, there's a, a couple other towns that I represent and that have regulations going back into the 20s and 30s. Well, what happened at the end of the 30s? Great Depression. 
there was no activity for a zoning commission. And then what happened after that? World War II. Nobody was doing anything except fighting a war until 1945. So it's not unusual to go to any town that has regulations that go back that far and see this large gap in the, into the 30s and, and into, you know, 45 or even into 50s. I believe in 1957, the Planning and Zoning Commission combined, and the first set of planning and zoning regulations was drafted. And I'm told by reliable sources that that's sort of the date that you've all been used to using when you think about nonconforming uses. Does it predate 1957? Now, it's true, you do have regulations going back to 25, but as I described, um, you know, there's no records. So the next thing you would do is go to the, so there's no records in any zoning office of when this building was constructed. I went to the building department. The first record they have of anything to do with this building, and I think it's one of the papers I just handed out, is from 1967. And that was for an electrical permit to update service. Now, I'm not offering that to tell you that the building was constructed in 1967. I'm saying that that's the first record of anything to do with this building from the town's perspective. But as you go out into the community, and you've seen through the documents we've provided, The community has known about this building back into the 30s when the property was owned by a Carl Schneider who operated a, something called Custom Farm Equipment and Construction Machinery in the 1930s. And that letter, I don't, I'm not sure if you want to look at my pile or let's look at the application. It should be one of the first ones. Margaret, I don't know if it's Boucher or Boucher. I've heard both uh, for that name. Boucher. Boucher. All right. She writes a letter saying that her grandparents, the Schneiders, all right, at this time it was known as 116 Raffia Road, and that's actually what the building department knew it as until very recently, um, saying that the building was constructed at some point in the 40s as far as she was con knew. Of course, her, her grandparents are, are no longer with us. Uh, there was an iron shop on the site. They uh, built custom farm equipment for farmers, and they operated until up until 1950. After that, they leased the property to Guimon Construction. They operated a construction yard continuously in a concrete business until 1988 as tenants. And the Dupres, who were heirs of the Schneiders, sold the building in 89 to Bull Brothers Construction, who operated there out of Windsor, operated a construction yard from the building until Gary bought it. Now, Gary's lived across the street for 69 years, correct? Yes. All right. Yeah. In That's my grandfather's house across the street. OK. And one of the things is a picture from around 1940 that's showing the building, right, or use of the property, along with a picture of two people standing in front of what we used to call station wagons. There's no such thing anymore, I guess, but. Those are the Schneiders, I believe. Yeah, the owners, the original owners. There's the building in the background. So I'm not going to take you through each of these letters. You, you, you can look at them yourselves. One of the other things is we talked about, or I mentioned, being known in a neighborhood. So Gary has provided me with, uh, oh, these are like a, a town map where people, you know, a street map, there's three pages, and they would have, people would, you know, buy advertising on the map, and you can see Geeman Construction is listed here on this map. Um, so... You know, he was advertising his construction and concrete contractors on this property when uh, that family operated it there. 
There's a picture, I think, which I gave to Commissioner Kwasnicki, um, and, and maybe Gary can speak to that. I don't know if it's made its way around. Oh, I'm sorry. No, I didn't. Here it is. So there's only one of these. This is something that's been hanging on the wall at, at your homestead for yeah. for many years. Just um, if, and I'll, I'll give this so you can turn it. Do you mind if I draw on it? No, go right ahead. All right. Yeah, a lawyer without a pen. Here, I got one here. <laughs> He's cool. Okay. I have a highlighter. Well, I'll ask Gary to draw a picture, uh, circle around this building. The building? Yeah. Yeah. And how old is this picture, Gary? Well, the shopping center is up here. I'll make an X, Raphael Plaza. My grandfather used to grow tobacco there back in the 40s. I'm assuming this is in the 40s. I can't be positive, but it's definitely, the shopping center was built in 1955, so. <clears throat> That gives you an idea how old that building is that we're talking about. And, and Gary, it's always been for use for commercial purposes, correct? As long as I can remember. And, and, and that's how you're using it today? That's not what I'm doing with it today. I'm yeah. trying to upgrade it and make it better. When Bob Higley moved out, God rest his soul, we took over the place and cleaned it up. And I figured I'd get a couple of good tenants in there to make it nicer and they're very low key and they're very quiet as opposed to how it was in the past if anything it's better than it was so in this packet you also have a letter dated april 14th from rosemary zachary who is also uh, a great granddaughter of, uh, of carl schneider who was the owner who constructed the building uh you know talking about when he came here from Switzerland, he started his own business and um, on that site. This is apparently moving. Some of the other letters are, are more recent um, lineage, shall we speak, is in terms of the building. There are uh, there have been a number of building permits issued by the. I just showed you one because it was the oldest one that's there, but for work on the property. Um, and it, it, it seems to me that um, if something had been in violation for 98 years, the, the notion that it was in violation would have come up well before today. Um, given that there's, again, been a number of um, building permits issued, which typically the zoning enforcement officer at the time would sign off on. Um, so. I, I can't get you back to 1925 or before, and actually, a part of this package, I'm sorry, I'm jumping around, but there's a, in 1992, um, there was a resubdivision of the property by Lenny Bull, and, and um, he built some houses in the back, so, and there's a map attached to that, which I think shows the property where, where the uh, existing building is. You can see there's a lot line revision plan prepared for Lenny Bull. Uh, existing building is shown there. So, Hold on what yeah, I'm sorry. So if if you go to, I probably should have numbered these for your convenience, okay, but I got it. Yeah, it's the, attached to the April 16th, 92 minutes. At the end of that section, you'll see a, um, a map. We're talking about the subdivision map, Mr. Lamberley. It says lot line revision plan. Can you look at me? Yes. This one? No, there's one before that. <coughs> this one? Yes. Show that. That there's a square box existing. No. Sorry. They're calling the existing shed. So this, the fact that this building's been here and used for commercial purpose has been well known to town officials for decades.
There's a note from uh, R.J. Toby saying he's lived in Enfield since 1941. It's always been farm equipment and construction. You see a neighbor of yours? Uh, uh, yeah, one of my neighbors. Okay. Friends, yeah. There's also a letter it says to whom it may concern from Catherine Crowley, Daryl Crowley. He's talking about the history and he's saying um, his family, his wife's family has lived on Raffia Road and 110 has always been a construction type property with various business operating out of this property. She recalls from her youth years a farm construction, I believe known as Schneider, operating on this, and he puts it back into the 1930s. There's a letter from Frank Toby, to whom it may concern. I've lived in Enfield for 86 years. The property at 110, 116 Raffia Road has been a construction yard dating back to the 1930s, housing several construction companies during this time. Carl Schneider, welding and farm equipment, Demon Concrete, Bull Construction, uh, Mr. Higley's operation. So that's, that's the information that we have, Mr. Chair, members of the board. It would appear that this building was probably constructed sometime in the 1930s and used continuously since then. Um, we admit that there were regulations back then. You know, if there were records that existed at the time when it was either in the building department or the zoning office, they don't exist anymore. So I have no magic bullet or whatever smoking gun that I can show you. So I'll be glad to answer any questions that you may have. Commissioners, uh, anybody have any uh, questions? Um, <clears throat> Mr. Landlina, uh, one of the things that you submitted, um, I believe you submitted this, about the Bull Brothers Corporation? Yes. Yeah. Just curious, their address is in Granby on all these documents. Right, that's where their corporate headquarters are. Okay, what was the purpose of submitting that? To show that they were in business. Okay. They were, you know. And I'm not sure if I actually submitted that or Rick did. Do you? That, that's probably from my pile. Yeah. Oh, from my okay. documents. Oh, all right. Apologies. Thank uh, you. Uh, Rick and I have known each other a long time, so we read each other's minds. Mr. Chairman, if I may ask, Mr. Yeah. Rochelle, uh, so the that was submitted for what purpose? Just I'm trying to p piece it together with the property address. So with these companies that have been there, other than well, I can't couldn't find a confirmation for Schneider at all. But all out of all the companies that have been there over the years, uh, the only one that had any actual tie to that address was Gumond uh, Construction that used that, uh, through the Secretary of State's office, they used that as an address in 1995. And subsequently after that, they moved from that business to, I believe, East Windsor. Um, but none of the other businesses, uh, whether it be Bull Construction or uh, Bob Higley, they all never used that as an address for a business. All right. Thank you. Commissioner Turner. 
What I am getting is that it's a nonconforming use. That's our argument. Yes, of course. The problem is the R33 versus business industrial, being it industrial. Right. And with all the documents I read, and we've gotten quite a few. Sure. It seems that none of the businesses that have used the, I'm going to call them garage. It's kind of a long building with multiple bays. garage bays, yeah. with bays. They never actually acted like a business there. The other ones early on did. And you're right, the planning and zoning, because I read back, they show that there was a business there that was a physical business. Right. It's the R33 versus business industrial zone that's causing the... Right, that's what makes it non-conforming. Non-conforming. Right. Yeah. But none of those businesses registered as that being their place. So the question at hand is that could happen going forward. Shouldn't they have come before planning and zoning and for a special permit or special use permit and required that they're on that, on that site? No, for for what kind of permit would what kind of permit would they need? I guess I'm going to ask that question to the zoning enforcement officer. Well, at the bare minimum, a, a business construction business going in, if it was an industrial zone, we would at the very least require a zoning permit um, to verify that that use is approvable and to determine, uh, make sure that they're not going to have any extra any outside storage, or if they are, it's going to be enclosed um, or behind the fence. Uh, something of that sort. Um, the issue here, again, is it's it's almost like I agree with you. It's a non-conforming use, but it being a non-conforming use in the prior years, as, as far as I can tell, there's only been one business used at that location. Now you have several businesses using it. Even if you consider it a non-conforming use, that would be considered an expansion of that non-conforming use. Right. That's how I'm seeing it, and they're not. They're not coming in front of the planning and zoning to discuss their business. Like if they were to go into a new salon site, they'd have to come in and talk about it. They're going in to use this building, even if it's a bay. They should have come forward to the town to say that's what they're doing on that site. And part of the problem is it's the R33 zone versus BI, uh, industrial, right? Is it right. And, and construction companies, you know, what we they determine, look at construction companies as, they're scrutinized so that uh, whether it be materials or equipment are screened from the uh, abutting properties. Mm -hmm. cool. Because wouldn't that also, one last thing to the zoning enforcement sure. officer, wouldn't cool. it also that if we were to consider, we take this, um, is this notice of violation or cease and desist? I'm sorry, I'm getting cease confused. Cease and desist. Technically, you that can't. whatever we do tonight will carry forward. This isn't just to this applicant, correct? Whatever happens tonight, would that if Mr. Uh, Raffia sold that business to Mr. Smith in five years, would Mr. Smith now carry forward with whatever our, uh, we do this evening? Correct. Yeah. Well, th that's the nature of a non-conforming use. But it's Unless it's been abandoned, it's a non-conforming use as a commercial, as a space for commercial enterprises, generally in the construction uh, you know, yard. Uh, Don't you know. disagree. Yeah. But the but, the companies that are going into those bays need to come through the front door and come to planning and zoning for for uh, review. Uh, under what theory? In other I words, think I, I have an office building, right? That goes back to before zoning, two hundred year or hundred year old office building that's always used for offices. Does it matter how that space is rented? As long as it's still office use? I believe, Mr. Landolini, you know that answer. It's Yeah, it doesn't matter. Yes, it does. How would it matter? It, we have people come in with salons that switch ownership, and they have to come back in, and they have, yeah. to, they have to file. Just like we talked about earlier, yeah. all we're asking is for people to come through the front door and make sure that they file with the town, and they, they're on the record. One of the biggest problems with the documents I have, and let me tell you, I have, they were coming fast and furious. Sure. Um, I appreciate that the public see, knows what was there as the nonconforming use, but it's R33 zone, not yeah. Industrial 1. I, I understand. And the issue going forward would be that whoever wants to rent those bays should have to come in, again, back to the Zoning Enforcement Office, wouldn't they need to come into planning and zoning and to have a site review? 
Was that the normal? Is that the normal? process if this was an industrial property as i said but we'd look not. at the u we no but it's not but which makes it more so because it's residential but even if it was a resi um industrial and a business came in for a use we would look at that use to determine whether or not it was applicable applicable for that uh zone and to determine uh what criteria would need for an approval whether it be a a uh, special use permit, for instance, construction companies have to get a special use permit from um, right, planning problem, and zoning. I totally agree. But my question is, is, since this is R33, this is residential, this is farm. It's not stopping them from using it for anything. But renting those bays out for particular construction business, landscape businesses, wouldn't those businesses want to, to if they want to go forward, they would have to come in front and let the planning and zoning department uh, Commission decide if it's to move forward or not. I mean, our job tonight is to sit here as, as a cease and desist on this use under R33, not industrial. No, and I'm saying at the very minimum in an industrial zone, they would have to at least they, come before. They would have to do that. But if and this is residential, which is more uh, restrictive in the types of uses. That's right. It's more restrictive. I, I, I respectfully disagree with everything that you just had that discussion. If you look at the law of non-conforming uses, mm -hmm. all right, specifically the language which was adopted in the last decade, it says, in order for me to abandon, you're saying it is a non-conforming use. I think maybe you're saying that. Mm -hmm. And that the law is that you, I, I, I have to basically stand up in front of the world and say, I'm abandoning this non-conforming use. And unless I do that, the non-conforming use continues until I abandon it. That's but, what the law says. And you cannot require me to go for a special permit or any other kind of zoning permit to continue the use of the building. It's a commercial building which has been used for commercial purposes since inception. And I don't, you specifically said to me as I took my notes this evening yeah. that if there was one business in that building until late. There's three businesses in there. Yeah. Or were. How, how would that matter? That's my question. It doesn't. I'm telling you, it doesn't. It. I don't think it does. Because I, if I go for any kind of permit in front of planning and zoning, they're going to say no because it's an R33. Right. Because I don't have to. So you're saying either I have to ask for a permit that I'm not going to get, that action is futile, all right? Go in front of planning and zoning to ask for what? To, to continue using it for the purpose that it's been used for for the last 98 years or nine, 95 years or whatever it is? I, I respectfully disagree with, with that analysis. I'm not disagreeing that it's a nonconforming use. So, so I guess the, you're, and again, I'm not, we're just having a discussion, you know. Mm -hmm. um, is it the fact that prior to this, it had always been used by one operator, and now there's three in there? Is that, is that what the hang-up is? I guess the, it's like anything else that happens in front of us. Yeah. It's future. I, We're yeah. really, our hands get so tied with future. You know, Mr. Raffia may handle this perfectly fine, and for the next 100 years that he lives, it'll be perfect. Mm -hmm. Mr. Smith comes along. Mm -hmm. And as you have already learned from coming in front of us this evening, mm -hmm. our records sometimes can get muddy. Right. You know, and in our intention, and we've had this problem with our minutes even, the only good thing that happens now is you can actually watch us. <laughs> and yes. hear our conversation. But sometimes our minutes are very uh, limited, mm -hmm. which then kind of leaves things murky for the next commission that comes along. So the issue at hand is, is the nonconformity. Do, do, because we've had this issue come in front of us. They've proven that it's been a non, it's been nonconforming use for 98 years. That I absolutely agree with. Mm -hmm. But has it been prior to the adoption of the regulations? Now, I know he, Attorney Landolina said 1957. I, I don't know where that came from. Um, but in other 
matters that we dealt with, it was the adoption of the regulations by the town of Enfield, which is 1925. And there's no getting around that the building wasn't, the building is not conforming. I, I mean, on a, a parcel, you can't have a, an accessory building without a primary dwelling or a primary building there. That's not been the case. This property has gone through a subdivision where it was uh, openly designated as uh, residential properties and subdivided, it went through a resubdivision. The issue of the use never came up through any of those those issues, yep. and and that's the problem. I I, I don't disagree with the facts that uh, there might have been companies there or there were companies there that used it, but it was never an approval for that type of use. I don't have any documentation on it. Um, maybe it, it was used that way, but there's no documentation on it. So, you know, unless you can show that it was. Uh, use as such prior to the adoption of the regulations, I mean, that's where the issue comes into play. But again, that goes to, that's why I spent three minutes talking about burden of proof. I, I mean, how do I, if there's no records available to review, how do I show you other than anecdotal information from people with secondhand knowledge? That's what, we're, that's, you know, that's what we're left with. But I think you can infer that this building uh, has not been existing for 70, you know, well, 80, 90 years in violation of the regulations. Someone's been ignoring it for, for 90 some odd years? That's, that's hard to believe. In a, in a very densely pop, I mean, Raffia Road is, right, and all the little subdivisions in there are, are densely populated. But I don't think we're here talking about the building itself. It's no. about the use of the building. I think you're right. Right, so I think we all can agree that the building's been there for quite right. some, the picture from 1950, it shows it. It doesn't show what it's being used for, but it shows it there. But the record, the evidence uh, that, that we pointed to in the letters show what it's been used for. Maybe we need to let the public speak. Yeah, uh, all the same types of uses, commercial type construction uses. And again, I think what Commissioner Turner was saying too is one business is different than three. Having those businesses approved becomes the challenge. And yeah, I, again, on a going forward basis, as you yeah. all know, we, we've got to do what we have to to protect. Understood. What, the yeah. property going forward. But I don't. I don't. I, I, honestly, I don't see that legally being an issue. And, and maybe you're, you ask the town attorney or something, because I'm fairly confident in my analysis that it's not an issue. If it's being used for the same types of businesses, whether it's one or three, it's not, not, it's not expanding. The same amount of space is being used. We haven't enlarged the building. It's all contained in the same area, the same building, all of that. So. Okay, I have uh, just a couple of questions of course. along the way here. I think you, you raised it when you said it's not, you haven't expanded it. Right. I, based on the conversation that you had with uh, Commissioner Turner, adding three buildings and at, at most of the time, it, that's expanding it. The thing that got my, my eye was uh, two things there. One, when I was reading the, um, the letter from somebody in your packet, one mm -hmm. of the packets here, because yeah. there are 39 letters, I believe, that we, we got and, and read. And they talked about something that happened. Uh, it was Mr. Herndon, I believe, uh, one of the complaintants. And it was yeah, about. Yeah, it wasn't in my packet. But. No, it wasn't in your packet. <laughs> we have a lot of paper here. Please uh, you know, work with us on that. Yeah. But he's talking about something that happened when Mr. Higley was there where he backed up uh, it, you know, a piece of equipment into a, uh, a diesel tank, I believe. Okay. Which gets to the point of why do we need to know something? Why should a, a company come forward so that we know what's going on? I mean, uh, in, in terms of hopefully to prevent it. You know, uh, Mr. Storney's talked about, you know, we're looking forward. You know, Commissioner Turner talked about we're looking forward. That's part of our job as well. Um, I think also it struck me that um, the previous uses of it were almost always construction yards. I'm going to say 90 percent, at least, of what we can piece together. They were talking about construction sort yards. Sort of that kind of use, yeah. Yeah, which yeah. to me is a pretty specific kind of use, okay? just looking at what I've read about it. Um, the three companies that came in there, 
are not the same, and they're not one maybe, and I'm not even sure how many of those companies are actually there because I think I, I'm going to look at the uh, our CEO, uh, uh, Mr. Rochelle. Did you have a hard time finding, you know, the where those companies were? You spent a great deal of time, I think, in your research trying to track down uh, what those companies were. I couldn't figure out from the names of the trucks what companies were there. But what, what companies did you come up with? Uh, Fortin, I believe, uh, Home Improvement. Is that what they go by? I'm sure. What's that, Schneider? For, uh, Fortin. Fortin. Fortin, is that one of your tenants? Yeah, he, that's uh, one of my tenants is Chris Ladd. He was a concrete contractor and landscaper. And Tim Flagg, who was a concrete contractor, construction. And then I have a guy there that just does garage door work. He just has a bag. And Tim Fortune is just parks his trailer there. He's a he's a carpenter. Okay. Everybody comes in in the morning, parks their cars, gets their equipment, and goes off to the job. When Bob Higley had it, he he brought in excavators, dozers, dump trucks, fill. He was had a lot more stuff. We had aerial photos of this that shows it from 2022 down to 2015. If you look at those, you'll notice a large difference in how it looks now compared to how it looked then. Bull construction used to cut up trucks, screen loam, had bins, <clears throat> had triaxles, real mess. My question is, and I've been wondering on this for a long time, why didn't the complainant get a hold of somebody 13 years ago, 17 years ago, when he purchased his house? Why did he wait until I started cleaning the place up to get on my case? <clears throat> That's a question that I've been asking. No, I, I, I hear you, and I have a similar question about why it lasted so long. Uh, I mean, you know, I, I understand it because we. I think it's we all sat here. better now yeah. than it was 13 years ago. Is it non-conforming? Yes. Are we trying to make it better? Yes. Are we looking for a hassle? No. I don't understand it. I, and, and, and I, I hear you. That's, None of us are looking for a hassle. We're looking to solve a problem. That's no, I, I'm that, a little hard of hearing, and I apologize. So am I. We got, <laughs> given the fact that no, this got me a little riled up. I didn't mean to do that. Uh, we're, 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 we're here to solve a problem. That's what we're hoping to do. I understand Okay, that. that's what we're here. We, and, you know, I we, would have never purchased the property if I knew it was a building lot. I, I have several building lots I own in the town, and I'm trying to do what I feel is better for this piece of property. I need some income to make it work. That's why I'm renting it mm -hmm. to two people. I only get two rent checks. Thirdly, I'm trying to make it better than it was, and I'm not looking to hassle my neighbors. I hear you. I hear oh, you. That's all I have to say. <coughs> Mr. Chairman, yes. uh, Attorney Landolina, mm -hmm. um, I'm going to, Rick, ask you the same question as well. Just for my clarification, legal nonconforming, um, so it's it's residential, but it's we're arguing that it's legally nonconforming. Does that l limit to what it can, does it have, what am I trying to ask? What so we're doing like, R33s? well, yeah, if it's legally nonconforming non for residential use, but it's for contracting work. Mm -hmm. Does that legal nonconformity, does that mean that it can then become a, a, I don't know, food establishment or something else? No. no. It would have to be in, in it's been a, essentially a contractor, construction yard kind of place. It would have to, in my view, would have to remain in that realm. Yeah, I couldn't open a restaurant there, I, you know, something like that. that. If it was understand? legal nonconforming, it, it would have to be stay as lead that legal nonconforming use or become less nonconforming. Right. Thank you both. Yeah. The one thing I didn't mention, and because I was looking today uh, with Rick, even though you had regulations in 1925, 
the zoning map that's discoverable only shows the Hazardville section and the Thompsonville section of town. It doesn't expand out to. So we're assuming that in 1925 this was a residential zone, but we don't have any hard facts to back that up either. Just a question for, for Mr. Vichelli. Do we have any idea when it was designated R33? Because it used to be, what, R17 was a, what, am I, if I've got it right, a, a residential zone? Yeah, I, uh, I'm not really sure the date when uh, they changed. I think it was early 90s where they changed it from R17s to R33s, 44 and 88s. Um, Research hasn't found any maps that lay that out. No. Um, so if I may. But wasn't R17 still? It was still residential. Still residential it was still residential farm. no matter what. Yeah. And, and never been business. It and never that, been industrial. And that parcel, even when it was owned by uh, the Duprees, was being taxed as a farm property. That's six plus acres of property. And that was after, uh, after Schneider's owned it. And prior to the uh, s this first subdivision. Mr. Landolini, you had a yeah. question? Yeah. Um, so... In 1925 through, I think, 1966, you only had two residential zones in town. They had residential A, residential B. And then after that, that's when you created the 17, 10, you know, to coincide with larger lots. So, and, and the only real difference was that in one of those zones, two families, I think, were allowed, and in the other zone, single-family houses were, were, only, were only permitted. So. But, again, assuming that it was residential back then, then whatever, it doesn't really matter what, how, what, what kind of zone it was in. We're just trying to piece it together. Yeah, I, I know. It's, 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 a, it's, a, it's a puzzle. Of just course. To, you know, and just trying to get to there. When we yeah. got to the subdivision uh, part of it uh, back in 92. That 92. Was a, that was the second subdivision, though, correct? Am I wrong? It was, it was a subdivision of a the subdivision. Second one, Rick? The, the 80, 89, I believe, oh. uh, was the first subdivision. 88 and 89 was the first subdivision. Then there was a resubdivision of that particular lot, what was considered 116 in 1992. Yeah, what was, it was actually a, a special permit to create two rear lots because yep. there's houses behind. And I guess the first subdivision must have been on the wings of uh, one on either side, I believe. Of that larger piece. Right. That, uh, parcel number one, I believe, on the maps that show the uh, subdivision. In terms of the, the 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 minutes of those of the meetings when they talked about that the subdivision, did they ever mention uh, the other lot that they this uh, building is on? Did Not, they ever talk about the use of it or any industrial use of it? Not really. No. I. I Okay, I wasn't sure that I missed it or not. But yeah, it's not in the 92. I don't know about the 80, whatever. No, neither of them was any mention of the use of that particular building. Nope. Okay. It just, just seems strange to me that, that they do the subdivision and not mention yeah. the other piece of the property. I can tell you that the other issue was that as part of the resubdivision, which complicates it a little bit more, um, there was an open space parcel that was supposed to get donated to the town or turned over to the town and the original documents on that are I have the file here it was never never, ha never, happened. never happened as a matter of fact I believe uh, the tax tax department was taxing uh, uh, bulls when they owned the property for uh, non-payment of taxes on that parcel and probably up to the point where you you purchased I think you even purchased part of the uh, the open space is part of the deed. Yeah, there was. Uh, there's records of a letter from Tom O'Malley, a lawyer who would have been around at that time from Windsor, saying to, I think, one of the staff members here, here's a copy of the deed for open space. What do you want me to do with it? And then that's, the, that's where the trail ends. But yeah, it's another interesting piece, but, you know, how relevant it is, but... Any other comments? Yeah, I will. I just want to make sure. Anybody hear any comments? Okay. Uh, 
we're happy to see so many of the public here right now. <laughs> okay, and I, I, before we go with that, uh, Mr. Attorney Lindalini, you had offered us, sent an email to us, asked us to incorporate in the record, I believe it was 39 items that had to do with some of the things you were just uh, going yes. over. Right. Okay. So, so I, we all have copies of them. Okay. Yeah, and I'm sure we've all read them. I've read them several times. Sure. But I'd like to just, uh, uh, for the record, just make a motion to incorporate those items that you had requested into the record. So, could I have so a motion? Moved. There? Yeah. Thank you. Thank moved, you, Mr. Moved Chairman. Moved by uh, okay, Commissioner Turner. Can I have a second, please? Second. All those in favor? Yes. Okay. Thank you. Just to take care of housekeeping. Thank you. All. Uh, and so we'd like to invite uh, the public to come here. And come up and we'd like to you know, share your, your comments Let's about your pro or con about the, uh, the appeal that we're dealing with right now. Um, just a couple of housekeeping things. If you want to speak about this particular issue, I'd ask you if you please, if you haven't already signed up, signed up on those pieces of paper over there so we can bring it up. We'd love to have you come up here and, and we'll call you up. Uh, uh, Mr. Rochelle, if you could get those uh, sheets or, yep. and just um, bring them over to us, we'll call you up. I know, I know from having read the letters that a lot of them were very, very <laughs> similar. They address some of the same issues. If you hear a letter that's the same as what, if, if you hear a speaker that's talking about the same issues, I, you could do, we still invite you to speak, but then maybe we could combine this. We have a large group and it's, you know, I have plenty of time, but maybe not all of you have that time. So um, at this point, uh, I'd like to call you up. When you come up, please give your name uh, and address and speak into the microphone, please. Okay, Chris Ladd, is he here? How are you? Hey, how you doing? Um, I'm a renter at 116 Abbey Road or Wyoming Ravi Road or 110. Is that your address or? No. Just oh, my home address. My name is Christopher Ladd. I live at uh, 18 Brackliff Drive in Windsor Locks. Thank you. I thought I was a long-term resident of Enfield until three years ago. Okay. Um, as far as the, I know about the property, my knowledge, um, I know the Guimans personally, and it was always construction. Enfield Welding was also in there in the Middle Bay, and Lenny Bowl was also there um, during 89 and 92. My father and Dave Fredericks, kept all their heavy equipment in there, all their trucks when they did the subdivision along the rinks. Um, myself and Tim, we both have small machines. Everything fits inside. There's no, there's really just one truck and a couple little attachments outside. And uh, we obviously don't want to cause any problems to the neighbors or whatever, you know, we're here to, you know, whatever we have to do to make it right, to make everything work for everybody. Um, but, you know, Regina Higley, she rented it for 14 years. She's a town employee. Her husband did town contracts, and he was a pig. And that's the bottom line. God rest his soul. And uh, I just feel that, like uh, Gary had said, 17 years goes by, and now you're going to start a complaint. It's just, uh, it just seems a little ridiculous, whether it's nonconforming or not nonconforming. You bought a house, you drive, you drove by that lot hundreds of times before you sign on the dotted line. You move next to a farm, shopping plaza, a building that was a total mess at the time. And a grown, any grown man or adult that looks at a building like that and still buys the house, and now 17 years later, it's a problem. It, it's, uh, to even hear him, I feel is foolish. Okay. Thank you very much. You're Appreciate welcome. it. <laughs> uh, Bert, is, uh, Bert Richardson? Please. How you doing? Hey, how's it going? Good. Bert Richardson, Hall Hill Road, Summers. Um, I just want to speak. Wait, you need to say it when you're sitting so that they can capture it on TV. Oh, I got to be on TV? All right. <laughs> you're on Change right my now. mind. I want to talk. <laughs> um, uh, Bert Richardson, Hall Hill Road, Summers, Connecticut. Now, I know bulls for a long time, and I know that they've worked out of that shop when they were there. Whether, regardless of whether they're registered there or not, straight up tell you, they were there. No questions asked. And that place was not pretty. And I don't know how anybody in the town never noticed it, never questioned it, and your records show nothing of it. 
I just don't understand how that could possibly happen. <clears throat> so I just want to let you know that that place was used as a construction company. I know Bob Higley. I know he was there. And that's the extent of what I know. But I just can't believe it was never noticed by anybody that works for the town, zoning, anybody driving by there and not seeing nothing and question what's going on here if this is a residential, residential area. So that's my story. Thank you very much. You're welcome. Appreciate it. Jeff Tingley. Hi, my name is Jeff Tingley. I uh, reside in 15 Hitchin Post Lane in Summers, but I own a building on 119 Post Road, the old Sterling Machine Building. Uh, <clears throat> I grew up on Dale Road, obviously walked to Kennedy. Uh, and passed what was game on construction, uh, obviously, since I was a kid. My stepfather owned a building business and did a lot of work with Gimons. So I'm here to attest that that building was there, to my knowledge. But <clears throat> during the conversation, um, there was some uh, banter about uh, occupation of building. So before I bought Sterling Machines building, um, it was just the one tenant Sterling Machine. And we now have three tenants in that building. And so we took one building that housed just Sterling Machine and put three different tenants in that building. And one of the things that happens uh, when we're doing remodeling or so on, the fire chief with the fire inspections and the building inspectors continuously bounce everything off of what was the historical use of the building. And that's what has allowed us to kind of have three tenants and use it the way we've used it because historically it was used that way. And that was something I learned that was unique based on just the inspectors coming through. I've worked with Rick a lot. He's very helpful. Um, but through their inspections, we've learned, or I learned, that the town bases a lot of what they do and decide on the historical use of that building. So like Gary's building that once housed maybe one construction company, and potentially there's three in it now, so does the 119 Post Road building, once housed Sterling Machine, now has three tenants. And then how we treat that building, and this was the interesting part that I learned, you know, hands on from the fire marshal and from the building inspectors, was there were a lot of things that we did not have to do because of the historical use of it which saved us money and that was helpful for us to get that project off the ground. But in turn, it was also helpful for the town. I think that building cost me, that building cost me 20,000 a year in taxes. And the Sterling Machine had seriously considered leveling the building because it sat unoccupied for four years because of the taxes. So this is how things can help using the historical, okay? So that was a, a real consideration. I think if you guys go by that property today, it's a beautiful piece. Um, we've done a lot to it and, and it's brought two uh, other companies to town, one from Summers, and another one is just moving from Bloomfield. Um, we had Eppendorf in there for a while, um, who has since moved across from Fermi, as you know. So um, that's all. I just wanted to come and speak on behalf of Gary. I've known him all my life. I've known the Guimond Construction Company. Um, my family worked with them, obviously. But then also, there was a lot of discussion about prior use and then having three tenants in one building when it used to just be one tenant. And um, you can see our building 
it's, it's not, I don't think it's offensive to the town and, um, and here we are paying our taxes. So that's all I have to say. Thanks for listening. Do you know what zone you're in? Yes. What zone are you? I'm industrial one. Yep. Thank you. Yep. Uh, Jeff Tingley? No, we had him. Oh, Jim Steffler? St oh. Uh, go on again. <laughs> uh, I, I apologize for the mispronunciation. Jim Stremfer, 221 North Road in Broadbrook. Uh, you have my letter in there. That goes back to 1971 uh, when I moved from Warehouse Point to Broadbrook and then we used that main artery to shop. Uh, I've always seen that building used for what it's used for. Uh, I, I get my firewood uh, from Gary and uh, he keeps people employed. He doesn't have to. And, uh, I think that's something we don't look at as the uh, individual uh, what an asset to Enfield. I would say mo ma mainly for him as a good person. I've known him a really long time and I used to sell wood to his father. And uh, I, I go there a lot and that place across the street's always been that way. I know he pays his taxes and we need people like that to, to keep working and uh, keep everything moving. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Bob Herndon. Good evening. Good evening. Bob Herbin. I reside at 108 Raffia Road with my wife, who's here with me tonight. We purchased our home in 2006. At the time, there was no sign of any commercial or construction activity next door. Had there been, we certainly would not have purchased it, obviously. Uh, to Mr. Ladd's point, you'd be an idiot to do this and then to, to buy a house knowing that it was construction and then come out of it and, and, and then beef about it 17 years later. So, sir. Yeah. Just tone it down, please, okay? I'm that's sorry. Just, that's just the comments. Am I being? No, I just, I, I, I'm just referencing like the idiot comment and stuff like that. Just, oh, I'm sorry. Okay, just... That's what he said to me. I'm sorry. No, we're, we're here to hear what you have to say. That was his statement to me. I'm sorry. Okay. Okay. Uh, there was no heavy equipment or sign of construction company at the time we purchased the home. Uh, Leonard Bold did own it at the time, but for the entire first seven years that we resided at 108 Raffia Road from 2006 to 2013, there was no sign of construction at all. Okay. Uh, it remained that way until Gary Raffia bought the building in 2013 and rented to Mr. Higley. Uh, Bob Higley started out, I always got along with Bob Higley. Great guy. Uh, seems like there's a lot of great people in this town, and there's probably a lot of great people behind me. I don't begrudge anyone the right to earn a living. I don't begrudge anyone the right to work hard and pursue what they want. I just ask that the commission respect the fact that this is an R33 parcel, and while it may have been construction from the 1930s forward, uh, as I'll get to in a minute, that changed in 1988. Um, Higley started small, but grew the mess uh, over time. And he always said to me, I know, I'll clean it up when I move to my farm. It's going to be okay. I'll clean it up when I move to my farm. And he placated me for almost 10 years before he unfortunately passed away. Um, again, I got along great with Bob Higley, which is probably why I didn't speak up sooner. Um, others have asked why I didn't squawk, as Gary put it to me last summer when he and I spoke about it. Uh, it was because Bob Higley was a kind person. I got along with him personally. I just had a problem with the mess that he had next door. Uh, and again, that began in 2013 when Mr. Raffi purchased the property. Okay. Um, after Mr. Higley passed away, I asked Gary Raffia a year and a half ago to keep it clean and keep it quiet. And obviously that has not been what's transpired, which is why we're here tonight. Um, we've established a number of tenants. Um, 
the spreading of asphalt millings and making it look as though it's a commercial parcel concerns me. I've submitted photographs to Mr. Rochelle, uh documenting the fact that it was dirt a year ago, and it now looks like a paved parking lot next door in a commercial property in a residential neighborhood. Uh, also, those asphalt millings were spread on what the town GIS maps denote as wetlands. And I'm not sure if that requires a permit, but I figured I should mention that as well. Uh, I'm seeing now transient soils entering the property from God knows where, contain God knows what. That concerns me, particularly since Mr. Higley did spill, already spilled diesel fuel on the property once. Now there's soils coming on the property. That is of great concern to me as well because I don't know where they're from or what is in them. Um, some of the zoning maps that have already been discussed tonight, uh, this particular one that was filed October 14, 1988, this was the original. I'm sorry, I didn't bring copies. This is the first time I've done anything like this. Excuse, Excuse me. me before. Do we have a copy of that anywhere? Um, I believe this is in Mr. Rochelle's packet. The yeah. Okay. In the upper left corner, it's volume 222, page 3126. It's an 1117. Hang on one second. Let me see if we can find it. Again, I apologize. I should have brought copies. Okay. We I think it was chopped in second pieces. That's it. Why I don't recognize it. Is that one? Let's say the number again. Uh, volume two two two, page thirty one twenty six. Nope, it's uh, it's an eleven seventeen. I don't think we have any that size. Thirty one. Tell me the number again. Thirty one twenty six. Thirty one twenty six. We got it. Okay. We got it. Okay. Sure. Now I can. Looks like this. Okay, that's what I needed. Thank you. Looks right. like this. Okay. So this is the original subdivision map filed October 14, 1988 by Leonard Bull Construction. Uh, as you can see by looking at it, across the, the frontage of Raffia Road, there are a total of six parcels denoted, four, five of them denoted by their property lines, the sixth one being parcel number one, which was the existing farmhouse that has been there since, I believe, the late 1800s, if I understand it correctly. Um, what is not shown on this map is the outbuilding, uh, and I'll get to that in a minute. Um, going from right to left, because that's the order the houses were built in, uh, lot number six is 106 Raffia Road, okay? Lot number five is my house, 108 Raffia Road. Lot number four is what was to become 110 Raffia Road, according to the subdivision map from 1988 when Bull purchased the property. Okay, then you've got uh, 118 Raffia Road, which was the original farmhouse. Moving again to the left, you've got 124 Raffia Road, and then I believe 126 Raffia Road on the far left as parcel number two. The reason that's relevant is because in 1992, which this map comes up, which we've seen multiple times tonight. Yeah. Okay. This map identifies the same six parcels across the Raffia Road frontage. And what they're really denoting in this map are the two houses that they're building in the rear at the end of the private drive. Okay. What I'd like to point out is on this map from 92, you do see the, you do see the outbuilding. Okay. Could you hold one second while we dig through this pile of paper and see if we can find our copy of it? Sure. Anybody find it yet? Yeah. I know I was, That's it's on the back idea. of it. Okay. Yeah. So they're here somewhere. If you find it, I'll look at yours. Wait, got it. Okay, you can look at mine. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> so you can see here as part of the, I guess the back left corner of lot number four. You see the, the footprint of the outbuilding on there. Okay. Now, clearly, this lot is on the 1988 filing for the subdivision of the six acres. And now it also appears as lot four showing the building on the 92 filing as well. That, to me, tells me that Bull Construction had every intention of raising that building and putting a house on lot four. Okay. Why they never did, I don't know. But I can tell you that this has been part of the subdivision plan since 88 for that to go away and for that outbuilding to be taken down and put a house on lot four. And it's here right on the maps and all the filings from 
bulk construction. So, so front, excuse me, that, yeah. that's the building with the three garage uh, doors? Correct. So oh, no, on fine. this map, if you can see, I've circled it here. Yep. That's the building in question. Yep. And then obviously, looking at this map, you could not have a residence on lot four and have that outbuilding remain standing. So to me, that is both construction's intent to raise that building and build a house there. Okay. Uh, so Mr. Raffia asked why, I, why did I wait? I believe I, I introduced that in my opening remarks. It was quiet from 2006 to 2013. There was no signs of construction. There was no signs of anything until he purchased the property and Mr. Higley started to move in. Uh, and again, I voiced my concerns to Mr. Higley. I should have addressed them with Mr. Raffia. And Mr. Raffi and I did have that conversation last summer of, I should have squawked to him sooner. There wasn't a problem until Mr. Raffi bought it. So the fact that I didn't overtly speak to him, I instead chose to speak to his tenant, doesn't change the fact that he'd already purchased the property when the problem became a problem. Um, he also said that, had, Mr. Raffi also stated that had he known it was a building lot, he wouldn't have purchased it. Well, I believe I just demonstrated that according to town records from 88 forward, it was denoted as a building lot. I'm not sure how that was missed, but uh, that was clear. Um, and again, yeah, that, I'm not going to be redundant. I, have, I apologize if I'm a little nervous here. I've never done anything like this before, but... Um, I think you can see that this is a residential neighborhood. It's been intended to be a residential neighborhood since the subdivision in 1988. And while there may have been many uses for the land and for the building prior to that, uh, I respectfully request that you uphold the cease and desist and protect our residential neighborhood. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Frank Pizzo, please. Frank Pizzo, 118 Raffia Road. Uh, I don't have as much history history as the rest. I moved in probably three to four months after Bob Higley occupied it. And I agree with Bob Herdman that it wasn't that cluttered at the time. Over the period of time, it had gotten cluttered. I thought this wasn't as complicated as it is. I was hoping that after Bob Higley passed and it was being occupied, that there would be some common ground. I actually went to Gary Raffia and said, if you have any kind of proof that you can do what you want to do, just present it. Possibly you guys can do, uh, work something out, but here it is. So I also, as a landowner, oppose the use as commercial. That's it. Thank you very much, sir. Tina Wright. Did I pronounce that correctly or did I miss? Trisha Wright. Trisha Wright. Okay. Yes. Uh, Trisha Wright, 106 Raffia Road. Thank you very much. I apologize. It's okay. Um, I haven't been there as long as some of the other people. We bought our property about two and a half years ago. And obviously, had we known that there was literally a construction site a couple doors down, that would have swayed our opinion a little bit more. Um, as far as it being quiet and eye-pleasing, I would disagree. I am a gamer, so I tend to have a headset on quite often, and I can hear lots of noise over my headset. And it's not something that is ideal for someone to sell their house in the future it is something that I worry about bringing the value of my house down and stuff so I would also in agreement with Bob that it should not be continued to be a commercial site can you tell me which house you are what number 106 Rafia I think you said it was lot four or something like that on six. the little map well if I did this right lot six you're the first house yeah 
He also um, want to point out that he mentioned about going bigger and better. So that implies that he does intend to expand upon what he currently has and encroach more on residential area. So that's something to consider moving to your opinion as far as future decision making, I would say. Who said that? They said it earlier. Thank you very much. We appreciate it. Mr. Rochelle, is there any more over there? I only have this one paper. If, if there's anybody else that would like to uh, speak, please come over and sign the sheet and then uh, and just come up. Is there anybody else in the audience that would like to speak tonight, either pro or con? Thank you, Rick. Right up. It's Karen. Yes. Thank you. Hi. Karen Warner. I live at 120 Raffia Road. I am one of the um, one of the lots that is in the back okay. with from the access driveway. My neighbor and I split off. And uh, so my property sort of abuts this construction property. Um, and I'm kind of well, first, I can address one thing. You mentioned Bull and the open space. Well, I bought the property when Bill, um, Leonard Bull was building the house, and he had said to me that he was deeding that open space to the town. Mm -hmm. I know you say there's some complications that it wasn't actually done, but that I know was his intent. I hope that happens. Um, the construction property was a mess for years. Gary has cleaned it up. I've been um, on and off out of work. I have injuries and whatnot and such and pursuing different matters. But so I've been home a lot. And it's not been really, um, the volume has not been terrible in my experience. Um, I appreciate that Gary has cleaned up the property. It was a nightmare for years. Um, and so, um, I don't know, I, I hope there's a way to um, find a happy medium to maybe allow, since it's been open and notorious for 90 some odd years, then it's been in a non-conforming use, that he be able to apply for a non-conforming use permit, perhaps, but be limited in that he cannot expand and uh, create more of a bigger business and create issues for the residential area. Um, we would like to have our property values remain decent and not have it be a business that expands and becomes something like a Tarno or, you know, something of that nature. So I'm not as much help because I'm conflicted with both. I want the nice residential area, but I'd like Gary to be able to pursue his pursuits with renting out the property. And um, Gary is a, a tremendous benefit to the community. and, and uh, very generous and helpful to the neighbors and myself as well. So I hope we can find some happy medium and uh, make everyone happy. Thank you very Thank much. Thank you. Darren. Darren Crowley, please. Mrs. Neville, you got my name wrong. <laughs> it means I can't read. <laughs> I don't write. I don't write well. I apologize. No problem. How you doing? Good. How are you? Good. Thank you for listening to me, uh, Daryl Crowley, two hundred seven Abbey Road, Enfield. Um, I've listened to this whole thing tonight, and it uh, has been very long. But uh, I want to make a couple points. Um, we say there's no records of this building, and it, and there's no records going back, and the town has no records 
of certain time periods. So with the fact that there's no records uh, showing such, such items, and we see maps that have a building and doesn't have a building, uh, but I've also made building lots myself and plan to, to, to change uh, a farmland into a building lot. And so putting a house property on that, but never built that house. And it was a building lot. Again, eventually down the road, and that may have changed. But records change showing parcels looking differently because of what is intended to be done that does not happen. So at this time that the uh, houses and the developments were being done, there was an intention to do something, but it did not happen. Well, we also have intentions that go on within school districts, as you know, Mr. Neville, where we are grandfathered in, regulations change from time to time. Uh, and we're grandfathered in until we make an addition or a change to the property. The structure has not changed. The property has not changed. The square footage of the building has not changed. Uh, the acreage of the property has not changed. And if it's been an existing use and you don't have records showing that it wasn't approved before there were records and changes aren't being made, it should stay the way it is. It should be grandfathered in. It happens in all kinds of fire regulations, state regulations. So uh, it should stay exactly as, as is until there's an application made for an addition or building expansion. The fact that one or two or three businesses running out of the existing structure should mean nothing. Thank you for your time. Thank you, Darrell. Is there anybody else who would uh, like to speak to before the commission? Second time. Anybody like to speak before the commission? And third and final time, anybody would like to speak before the commission? Please come up. Thank you. I move to close public hearing. No, no wait a minute. We need to have a. Oh, I'm sorry, Mr. Landolina. Mr. I would not yeah. want to take your. No, we would never steal, steal your time here, Mr. Landolina. If you'd like to speak, please come up. Thank you. You know, I wasn't just going to go away. So, um, the one thing, and I, I think Mr. Crowley uh, hit on it, and, but um, I'll put it in a little bit different terms. I, I think uh, Mr. Herndon, I think that was his name, the neighbor, um, thinks or argued that the 88 subdivision was, is, is smoking gun because on the map, there was a proposal to uh, subdivide uh, some of the lots along the frontage, creating a lot number four, which would have bisected the building. And that's the, that's the original map that you all saw. So as Mr. Crowley said, maybe it was the intention. Normally, you know, after do having done this work for a while, you would put a note on the plan that said building to be demolished. Maybe there's a bigger plan that, that's not here. All we have is this, so we don't know. We can't speculate. All we know is what actually occurred. And after this subdivision was approved, no, the building never came down. Matter of fact, Mr. Bull did a revised lot line adjustment, taking the old farm property, which was lot one, and lot number four and redrawing the lot lines to create a smaller house lot for the existing, that old farmhouse that went back to the 1800s and giving most of that land that was behind the existing building to create a larger lot number four. And that's this lot line revision map prepared for Lenny Bull, uh, I don't know the date here, 2001 it looks like. So that's what actually occurred, regardless of what the intention might have been previously. And that's what my client bought in 2013 from Bull Brothers Construction. And I and I'll, to the extent that this isn't in the record, I'll hand it over. This is describing the lot number four as shown on the revised map, not the original subdivision map. So um, 
again, I, I, I think I've made the point that nonconforming uses stay in place until they're abandoned. Uh, that law got uh, exponentially uh, made stronger for the in favor of the owner of a nonconforming use. It used to be we had regulations that said something if you stop using a building for a particular use for one year, we deemed it to be abandoned. And then the law changed and said you can't make, uh, you can't rule a nonconforming use abandoned because of non use for a specific time. And that was the law for many, many years. And as of a few years ago, within the last seven, eight years or a decade, they made that law even stronger and said, until you declare this use to be abandoned, it stays in place. In non-use for any time. I, I knew, uh, uh, I have a friend who's a lawyer. There's a case out of downstate somewhere, tried this case, where a hotel had been not used as a hotel for 50 years. It in a 50 years. And his client wanted to reopen the hotel in a residential zone, went to the Supreme Court, and the Supreme Court said, it doesn't matter how long it's been. Unless he did something to say, I am declaring this no longer a hotel, it remains a hotel. So nothing here has occurred where anyone has stood up and said, I am declaring this building to be no longer used as a place to house construction type uses. Until that occurs, in my view, it can be continued to be used in that manner. Now, if there's a particular use that the zoning enforcement officer has a problem with, then maybe that's something that can be dealt with. But to say that because there's three tenants instead of one, one particular user, therefore that's an expansion, I, I disagree with that analysis. So um, I have nothing further. I, I, I think. You understand the, the, the facts, and the, I'll give this to uh, the staff. It may be in the record already, but certainly the lot revision map is already in the record. So I would ask you to, and if you wanted an opinion from the town attorney, you know, I don't, you know, we have 35 days to close this. Um, we have no problem with that on any of the matters that, that we've discussed tonight. But I'll leave that to you if you want to close the public hearing or, or not. Um, so uh, with that, I guess I'll take my leave unless you have any other questions. Could you, before you go. Sure. Could you help me with the map a little bit? I'm a little confused. Yeah, which. I don't know. Let's use the bigger one. Okay, that's so the, yeah. This is, this is the Raffia property here, including number four? No. Does it include all the way over here? No. So lot number four was that small. Right, it's what you've done, it's what's happened. Wait a minute, it would have, this yeah. one, where it's a little smaller. Yes. So the building that we're talking about, this one, went over now the prop is kind of incorporated. Yeah, Let's so that make two squares, back here. the one on the front and the one in the back that you point to, were all intended to go along with the farmhouse. This. Correct. Okay. And then when that subdivision was done. So kind of like this property, let's make believe, is cut right about here somewhere. So this building, this is the building we're talking yeah, about. Yeah, what they did is they figured out how much of a side yard they needed. To, and then, then and then move the line over in the other direction and then added so the back all space. all of this technically. <laughs> Except that open space, which. We don't right, know where it is right yeah, now. Yeah, right. But let's make believe it's, it's, it's this. Now, is it's now the lot. Okay. Yeah, on this uh, map. Okay. Mr. Chairman, I prefer that we don't close the hearing and that I would like read to my, ask, you read my mind. I would like us to table it and get the town attorney's opinion about our 33 lots versus I-1 Absolutely agree. and see what that the configuration versus what it has to do with nonconforming. Totally agree. I think we need a little more information. Absolutely. I, I agree with you. Yeah. Yeah, I would entertain a motion to So I made that a motion okay. that I would like to table this until we get a town attorney's opinion regarding R33. Second by Mr. Stroni. I, uh, and uh, all those in favor? Should you we close the public hearing? No, no, we don't want to no, close no, the public hearing. Oh, right. We're keeping right. it open. Yeah. All those in favor, raise your hand. Any opposed? No. So do we need to have 
to, um, to the CEO through the chairman. Do we need to have a, a period of time? Does he need a window of time to keep this so we don't end up with the 65 days or whatever it is? So, so the, as long as the next hearing is within 35 days of next tonight, month. we're okay. Right. We can't guarantee that the town attorney will. So if you need more time, so we have an extra 65 days okay. that we can add to that 35 days, so you could technically stretch out the public hearing for 100 days. If we you need, need more time, go through staff, and we'll gladly give you whatever you need. So if the town attorney says, I'm doing this, but there's a lot, you know. Um, so that's the question. Yeah. Do we need anything in writing this evening? Yeah, so I, I would ask you to, when you say continue to the next meeting, have a date specific. It would be the next 22nd. meeting. Okay, yeah, you have to say that on the record, otherwise we have to publish so again. Okay. So I would like to please make sure that, Mr. Landlillian, you know that I will not be here on that meeting. If that matters to you or not, there will be one of my commissioners. Okay, so May 22nd. 22nd is the, the date of our I will see what happens, and then if we need to go into June, We'll just give you a consent to do that. I just nope. want to let no. you know. Yeah, thank you for that. We'll have a better idea probably in the next uh, week or so of when we can do that meeting. Yeah. The town attorney. And then we can work. Yeah. And, you know, I think you should, Rick can have that for the record. Get to you I, and, yeah. And, yeah. All right, fair enough. So we're we're going to just put this on hold. Mm -hmm. yeah, Very good. And able to at least the 22nd. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Lena. We appreciate it. Everybody, hold on to your materials. Yes, hold on to your material. Okay. Hey, Rich, could you see if uh, uh, Andrew is out there? <laughs> Read my mind. Yeah, I have to keep those in the copy of those two main things. Oh, okay. Everything that you hear in the side of the main copy. Oh, okay. I didn't understand that. Oh, okay. Yeah, yeah. 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 I know I have minutes in here, so please. I, I got, I got. Okay, I don't um, think I found anything I in there. I didn't see anything. They was, they were pretty sanitized minutes. I would like to. I, I mean, you can see what happens when minutes are not done detailed. And and I think that's what we have here. The only thing that saves us is the fact that they can go and watch the video Correct. to hear it verbatim. That our minutes are are so sparse. That sanitized would have been a bad word to use. <laughs> I would go with the bars. Yeah. Back on with the agenda. Yes. Okay. Now we're on to the approval of minutes, March 27, 2023. I make a motion to approve. Second. Okay. Any any discussion by anybody? Any changes? Everything looks good. Looks okay. All right. Uh, all those in favor? Aye. Aye. There's none opposed. Uh, correspondence and staff reports. Staff, is there anything you have for us that we haven't already heard about? <laughs> um, I don't believe so. The only thing I'd like to bring up, though, is uh, the issue of fees for appeals. Uh, You're right. Several years ago, that was changed. It was, well, it was determined by this board not to. Uh, charge people for appeals. And I think the reasoning behind it was that one was filed, you know, appeal was filed and they, I guess it was uh, felt that they, the people should not have spent the money to file an appeal. And we couldn't give the money back. And we couldn't get, we had, it has to come through the town council. Right, we right. can't do it. Right, um, we can't reimburse them. Yeah. The, and one of the issues with people filing the appeals, one of the matters tonight was, well, 
if I only have to pay, if I don't have to pay anything for an uh, appeal, rather than filing a variance, I'm going to file the appeal. I didn't want to say that, but that, that's that what it was. was. Oh, okay. So I kind of guessed that that was the reasons. issue, right? So um, I'd like the, uh, the board to take that into consideration, maybe uh, have some discussion during the next meeting. I mean, we spend a lot of time, you, you can tell by the amount of, uh, of uh, documents that have to get submitted, a lot of time and effort. Uh, and I think there should be a <coughs> fee for an appeal. I'm not bringing things to the board that is not a violation. And if they choose to appeal it, then they choose to appeal it. But I still think they should be charged. Mr. Chairman, is there any reason why we wouldn't charge around the same price for an appeal versus a... I think the reasoning back then when we said that we didn't want to charge was that it was a response to an action that the towns brought to them rather than them seeking to do something in the affirmative. And we felt that they shouldn't pay for that. And we wanted to make sure they had access to that remedy. Right. Because they may not, may, that may be an issue for somebody. And now we have, now we see both, it's like a two sided sword. Right. So the question is you make them free, right? They come in front of us and they don't come for the right thing. And I think the public doesn't understand. Our hands are strictly tied to what's in front of us. Notice a violation, mm -hmm. cease and desist. We can't move to the next step if it's not in front of us. When they come into the office, they're, they're, given, the uh, they're given the options. They're explained the options. They're told that they have to, if they choose to file a variance, they have to show a uh, a uh, hardship and it can't be monetary anyways and it can't be self-imposed and once they hear that and they say well, well let me I'm gonna appeal it rather than and sometimes appeals are used to draw things out a little um, to the advantage of the Rick, what, what did we charge prior uh, I oh, think I the know. fee I think the fee is still on on the actual application I don't know if I can hang on I think we thought at the time it was kind of expensive. Yeah, it was 120 for residential or 185 for non-residential. Well, this is a zoning board of you have the appeals. What if we split the difference between nothing and something to something that used to be? So it's a little skin in the game, but it's but, not like for those that are. The other the other issue is each time an application comes in, don't forget that sixty dollars is supposed to be going to the to the state. Love whether it be a any land use application. So that comes a lot of times we we're below that sometimes with some of these in in these cases where these appeals haven't been uh, paid for and they're free basically uh, the town has to bite the $60 that goes down to the state on each one of them. Mr. Chairman, I would like to have the office come back with a proposal. I don't want us to do it. I so well, could I would through you to them Come back with a proposal. Why don't we check with area towns and so, see what the area Come towns are charging sure. and we'll, Whatever we'll have you something to sleeve. go sure. for. And, and, you know, it, I mean, it would be possible if we could recover the town's fee at least. Bingo. That, it would, that might be the compromise. Yeah. Just, just a curiosity question on that, Mr. Chairman, to the CEO. Is it possible to collect a check and hold it until... Or is that one of those things that has to be cashed? Yeah, no, seat? that's part. Yeah, once it okay, comes months. in as an application, we have to... Okay, understood. You have to take... Sure you knew where I was going with that, too. Okay. So, are we done with that one? Yeah, we can move on to other business. I think you what have What happened some. with our last, the fella from Manning Road? Did that get handled, or what are we doing? Uh, it'll be handled uh, completely in a couple of days. Okay, so... Not much movement. He's okay. He'll be issued a citation if he doesn't uh, come through. He's... Been going back and forth, uh, complaining about the fee for the special permit, and uh, supposedly he has to go to active duty or something within the next week or two. I don't, I don't know. It is what it is, and uh, if he doesn't come through with an application for a special use permit, I'm going to issue the citation to him. So, and where are we with the cars, the Enfield Cell Cars place? I sent you a picture of it. They're advertising on the uh, carts at Big Y. Uh, he paid a $900 fine on the citation, and everything has been filed in accordance with uh, the approvals. So has he filed a K-7 yet? A K-7 has been filed. When am I coming in to sign it? I already signed it. Oh, is that one? That was the deal at that time. Oh. He said, go ahead and do it once he completes everything. Okay. Filed a special permit. 
for PNZ. Uh, he was given a diagram, site plan application that, uh, approval that went along with the K-7 that had to be filed with the Motor Vehicle Department, and he's submitting a signed permit finally. Okay, okay. so we're getting there. Yeah. And uh, I have two new ones for you to put on your list of things to do, but one you've already heard about. Um, on the property of Enfield Street and Weymouth Road, the mobile station, yep. I want to put it on the record now, and I will follow up with photos. Somebody is dumping pallets on Mr. Triano's property. And they come, then they disappear. That We think that someone's using it as a depot would be my interpretation. They come, they dump them on the weekend, midweek or so, someone comes and picks them up. They were there yesterday, and they were gone this morning when I came. On today. Yeah. They'll be yeah, back. I've noticed that, too. It might Maybe it's somebody different dropping them off than picking so, them up. We think so. We think so. So I'm going to ask you if you could uh, research that information that I passed on to you, but I want to make it a formal complaint, and okay. maybe we can ask Mr. Triano. I hate the fact that we are now going to have to add no dumping to his signs. I mean, the, he's been very... Um, Good. The second one is, is I've noticed that tractor trailers are being are parking all over Enfield. I was down doing clean sweep this weekend um, in Thompsonville, mm -hmm. and there was a tractor parked at the vacant um, Yankee Bait and Tackle building. Um, that truck belongs to the new owner. Well, I've had discussions with him in the past about parking it there. Okay, They're just so the tractor portion. Just the tractor. The white one? Yep. Yeah. So then you go on to Alden Street. The parking lot between Pleasant and Alden, that parking lot right there, there's a blue one parked there. And if you just get really bored and have nothing to do, I'm sure you could drive around town. So we seem to be having a bit of tractors being parked here, there, and everywhere. Okay. Now, I know that the owners probably think that it's not a difficulty, but it just everything runs amok, as we all seem to learn sometimes. So I'm going to take Enfield sales cars off my checklist. They're done. You can take that one off. Okay. Nothing else on there, Mary. I'm looking. <laughs> K7 still hasn't been voted out of, so I'm still waiting on that. Okay. Still alive? Still that was alive. Question. <laughs> I have two more questions. Right? Sure, go ahead. Uh, what's the status on 128? Uh... The town attorney has submitted a uh, their portion of a reply back. To the, yeah, uh, the uh, yeah. I saw. I believe the town attorney has submitted the uh, documents back to the court on behalf of the town um, for the supposed or reported uh, complaint regarding the information that was given to the ZBA. Is that what it's about? Yes. <coughs> okay. And it was because he, he his his claim is that uh, information was given to, given to you and not given to him. It was basically the same information that was already discussed at a meeting, but it was in a written form, and he didn't get part of it. And and that's what the uh, a lack is. of discovery, that kind of thing. So yeah. I also saw that we have an additional one from our last meeting, that's right. from. Uh, the Abbey Road one? The Abbey Road property. What's That's been filed with the town clerk, yes. There's an appeal on the uh, yeah. on the appeal. determination, the upholding of the uh, violation regarding the excavation on the property. And basically, basically what it is is that uh, ZBA didn't have purview over it because it, it's their belief that it was strictly a uh, uh, inland wetlands uh, purview rather than uh, zoning. And, and in it, it mentions <coughs> the maintenance of the pond. It doesn't mention anything about the excavation, um, just maintenance of the pond. And based on that, it should never have come to ZBA for the excavation portion of it. That's mm. interesting. Aren't they going to inlands and wetlands? They have been going to inland wetlands. And uh, I've gone to a couple of those meetings also, and they're... Uh, they submitted what's called the determination of permit needs for four ponds. They've since pulled the applications back on three of them. Uh, and the, f the fourth one, the pond in question, I believe they're, uh, I'm not sure what the, the, what the status is. I think they're going to have to go and actually get a permit. Uh, 
you know, because of the amount of activity over there. But that's up to I IWWA. Anything else? Uh, have a motion to adjourn? Motion. Second. All right, we are adjourned. <laughs>